Introduction to the Chronicle History of King Lear, the original of Shakespeare's King Lear, edited by Sidney Lee, Lit D. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please contact LibriVox.org. Introduction First production of the piece in 1594. The British legend, of which King Lear is the hero, was first turned to purposes of drama in the spring of 1594. On 6th April of that year, and again two days later, Philip Henslow, the theatrical manager, notes in his diary that a piece which he calls King Lear was acted at the Rose Theatre in London, quote, by the Queen's men and my Lord of Sussex together. End quote. Two distinguished companies of the day were acting in combination, the one company being under the patronage of Queen Elizabeth herself, and the other under the patronage of one of the Queen's leading courtiers, the Earl of Sussex. From the first performance Henslow derived the fairly substantial sum of thirty-eight shillings, and from the second that of twenty-six shillings. Footnote. Henslow's Diary. Ed. Gregg, 1904, Part 1, page 17. Henslow, by an obvious slip of the pen, gives the year of the first entry, 1593, instead of 1594. It is probable that the piece was written originally for the Queen's Company, and was first performed by that company before its temporary junction with the Earl of Sussex's men. End of footnote. In succeeding entries on the same page of his diary, Henslow mentions the production, all in the following June, of three plays whose titles also strike a Shakespearean note, viz. Andronicus, Hamlet, and The Taming of a Shrew. Andronicus is doubtless the sanguinary tragedy which was first published in 1594 and is included in all editions of Shakespeare's works. Hamlet and The Taming of a Shrew are early dramatic versions of popular stories on which Shakespeare brought his mighty faculty to bear at a subsequent date. Henslow's play of Hamlet is not extant. The play of The Taming of a Shrew was, like Titus Andronicus, printed and published in 1594, the year of its production by Henslow. The same significance which belongs to Henslow's contemporary venture of The Taming of a Shrew attaches to his King Lear. Henslow's King Lear laid the foundation on which Shakespeare built a dozen years later the stupendous tragedy which is known by the same title. The play of 1594 was the clay out of which Shakespeare fashioned the most poignant of all his triumphs in tragic art. Publishing Licence of 1594 Some mystery envelops the history of the publication of the pre-Shakespearean drama of King Lear. On May 14, 1594, a month after Henslow produced the piece at the Rose Theatre, Edward White, a London stationer and bookseller, obtained a licence from the Stationers Company to publish, quote, a book entitled The Most Famous Chronicle History of Lear, King of England and His Three Daughters, end quote. Footnote. Arbour, Stationers Register, 2, 649, end footnote. There is no reason to doubt that the play to which Henslow's diary refers was the book which Edward White received this licence to publish, but no publication of King Lear corresponding with the date of the licence of May 14, 1594 has come to light. There is a remote chance that the book was published in a small edition, every copy of which has disappeared. We know that the play of Titus Andronicus, which Henslow produced in the same year, was, after due entry in the stationer's register, published by Edward White, the licensee of King Lear, in partnership with another stationer, during the eventful year 1594. All original copies of this first edition of Titus vanished from sight until 1905, when a single exemplar was discovered in Sweden. The elusive problem of Edward White's dealings with King Lear may ultimately be solved by a revelation of like kind. At present there is no tangible proof that his licence of May 14, 1594, materialised in the shape of a book. Footnote. It is worth noting that on the same day that White received his licence for King Lear, 
he obtained permission to publish four other plays, viz. The History of Friar Bacon and Friar Bongay, The Famous History of John Gaunt, Son to King Edward III, with his Conquest of Spain and Marriage of his Two Daughters to the Kings of Castile and Portugal, etc. The Book of David and Bethsaba, and A Pastoral Pleasant Comedy of Robin Hood and Little John, etc. Of these four pieces, only one is extant in an edition of 1594, viz. The History of Friar Bacon and Friar Bungay, which was by Robert Green, and is described on the title page as having been, quote, played by Her Majesty's servants, end quote. Of David and Bethsaba, which was by George Peel, the earliest edition now known was published not by Edward White, but by Adam Islip, five years later, in 1599. No copies of Robin Hood or of John of Gaunt are known to have come from the press at any time. The Conquest of Spain by John of Gaunt is mentioned by Henslow early in 1601 as a joint production of William Rankins and Richard Hathaway. For a careful analysis of the accessible information respecting the publication of the old play of King Lear, see a paper on The Date of King Lear by Robert Adger Law in the Publications of the Modern Language Association of America, Volume 21. End footnote. The Publication of 1605 On May 18, 1605, after the lapse of some eleven years, King Lear reappeared in the pages of the Stationers Company Register as the title of a projected publication. A stationer and printer named Simon Stafford then obtained a new license to publish, Quote, a book called The Tragical History of King Lear and His Three Daughters, etc., as it was lately acted. End quote. To the new license, a note of somewhat unusual character was appended. It ran to the effect that Stafford, the licensee, assigned on certain conditions his right in the copy to a bookseller named John Wright. The company authorised Wright to publish, in place of Stafford, The Tragical History of King Lear and His Three Daughters provided that Simon Stafford shall have the printing of this book, end quote. Footnote. Arbor, Stationers Register, 3, 289, end footnote. The license in this qualified shape took effect. Stafford quickly printed a volume which was duly published by Wright with this title, The True Chronicle History of King Lear and His Three Daughters, Goneril, Regan, and Cordella, as it hath been diverse and sundry times lately acted. That work is reprinted in this volume. Original Copies and Reprints The volume is rare. Only three copies are now known, and one of these is imperfect. The two perfect copies are respectively in the British Museum, Pressmark 161A51, and in the library of Mr. A. H. Hooth, the former of these is slightly cropped. The imperfect copy is also in the British Museum, press mark C34, 1. Two leaves, C2 and C3, are missing from the volume and are supplied in manuscript. The original edition has been thrice reprinted already, for the first time in 1779, by George Stevens in his Six Old Plays, Volume 2, pages 377 to 464, again in 1875 by Mr. W. C. Hazlitt in his revised edition of J. P. Collier's Shakespeare's Library, a collection of the romances, novels, poems and histories used by Shakespeare as the foundation of his dramas, volume 6, pages 305 to 387, and lastly in 1907 by the Malone Society. Stevens reprints the text with great care, although he is not immaculate. Mr. Hazlitt's edition is defaced by numerous typographical errors. The Malone Society's reprint, which was prepared by the Society's general editor, Mr. W. W. Gregg, and was checked by Mr. R. Warwick Bond, satisfied every requirement of accuracy. The Stage Directions the statement on the title page of the 1605 edition that the piece, quote, hath been diverse and sundry times lately acted, end quote, is amply confirmed by the abundance of stage directions scattered through the text. 
the printer clearly worked on a manuscript prepared for theatrical uses. The numerous stage directions possess an interest of their own. They illustrate the mode in which the tragedy was represented in the Elizabethan theatre. Though scenery was absent, there was no lack of properties, of appropriate costume, or of suitable musical accompaniments. A table spread with food and drink, pots of ale, riding wands, books, purses, a basket, bags of money, swords and daggers, are all specifically noted as implements requisite to the action. The Gallian king and his companions twice adopt disguises, in the first case appearing in the habiliments of pilgrims, and in the second in the dress of, quote, country folk. The kings of Cornwall and Cambria make their entry in one scene, quote, booted and spurred, and elsewhere cast lots with dice. Mariners are described as wearing sea gowns and sea caps. Appropriate illustrations by means of sound are likewise enjoined. Claps of thunder accentuate the perils of King Lear's wanderings. In the concluding scenes, drums and trumpets are frequently bidden accompany the incidents of battle. Quote, a still, i.e. softly played, march, end quote, shows that modulation was observed in the execution. Mingled notes of drums and trumpets bring the play to a close. The gestures of the actors are also defined, and hints given as to their facial expression. The characters are bidden, quote, start, or, quote, frown. Now they whisper together, now show signs of faintness. They sleep and wake and reel. In the fight, they chase one another, quote, to the door, at the back of the stage. But in spite of the amplitude of the stage directions, other apparatus which is necessary to make the progress of the representation quite clear to the reader is wanting in the original edition. Save for the appearance of the words, Actus I, on the opening page, the original text is without scenic divisions, and lacks a list of dramatis personae, or any specific mention of the, quote, scenes of the action. A list of characters in order of entrance was, with scenic divisions, first supplied in the Malone Society's reprint. In the present edition, divisions into acts and indications of the various, quote, scenes of the action are given for the first time as well. The full stage directions, with their precise notes of the entries and exits of the actors, clearly suggest the beginning and ending of each successive scene. The intended limits of the acts can only be conjectured. They appear to be of irregular lengths. There is less difficulty with the scenic descriptions. The speeches throughout plainly suggest the various places in which the episodes unfold themselves. The History of the 1605 Edition There is little question that the present play of King Lear which was published in 1605, was identical with the work which was produced by Henslow at the Rose Theatre and was licensed for publication by Edward White in 1594. Footnote. A difference in the titles of the two pieces as recorded in the two licenses of the Stationers' Company cannot be overlooked. The earlier entry describes the piece as, quote, the most famous chronicle history, end quote. The second entry changes the designation into, quote, the tragical history, end quote. The temper of the drama of 1605 may well be termed tragical, in spite of the happy ending, but the misdescription, such as it was, was corrected on the printed title page, and lends no colour to the inference that the two entries in the stationer's register relate to two distinct works. End of footnote. Internal evidence clearly points to the earlier year as the period of composition. A like conclusion is strongly supported externally by the personal relations which subsisted between John Wright, the publisher of 1605, and Edward White, the licensee of 1594. Wright was White's apprentice from 1594 to 1602. King Lear was the first publication which he undertook after he had acquired, under White's auspices, the freedom of the company, June 28, 1602. Wright's issue of King Lear in 1605 was doubtless the fruit of some friendly negotiation with his old master. Footnote. 
John Wright, who was a bookseller only, not a printer, mainly dealt in chapbooks and ballads, but he undertook the sale of half of Thorpe's famous edition of Shakespeare's sonnets in 1609, and in 1611 a reprint of Marlowe's Faustus. End of footnote. Nor was White's legal interest in the play of King Lear extinguished by Wright's action. The copyright descended to White's heir, and on the death of his son in 1624, it became the property of the son's widow. Footnote. In 1624, the younger White's widow made over the copyright of King Lear to another stationer named Aldi. When Aldi's widow died in 1640, the copyright passed to her son-in-law, Olton. That the line of descent is traceable through so long a period is evidence that some pecuniary value was thought to attach to the copyright for more than half a century. First Publication of Shakespeare's Lear Some additional bibliographical data are necessary to the full understanding of the place that the old play fills in the realm of Shakespearean study. Shakespeare's great tragedy of King Lear was acted at court on the day after Christmas in 1606, the year following Wright's publication of the old piece. Shakespeare in all probability penned his own play within a few months of its presentation at Whitehall. Eleven months after that event, on November 22, 1607, two stationers, Nathaniel Butter and John Busby, obtained a license to publish, quote, a book called Master William Shakespeare, His History of King Lear, end quote. Shakespeare's work was first published in 1608. Thus, the old play in the extant edition of 1605 was on sale in the bookshops nearly three years before Shakespeare's dramatic version of the legend was at the disposal of the reading public. General Characteristics The uses which Shakespeare made of the old play constitute its supreme title to study. At the same time, both choice and treatment of topic give the piece some genuine interest from the point of view of the literary historian. The choice of subject illustrates the strength of contemporary enthusiasm for national legend. The treatment shows how a modicum of ingenuity and dramatic faculty or instinct might, in an era of unusual intellectual and spiritual alertness, infuse human interest and pathos into the bare improbabilities of legendary narrative. New characters and incidents vivify the old record with a liberal and often surprising originality, yet in the more artistic or aesthetic aspect, the work remains an elementary essay in the dramatic art. The dim intuitions of character are without subtlety. The verse is manipulated with a cold correctness. The language is rarely touched by poetic emotion, though its simplicity leaves little room for false sentiment or bombast. Footnote. The writer's grammar is at times open to exception. The frequent employment of the singular verb with a plural subject, C2, 4, 104, note, is no uncommon Elizabethan usage. But the habit suggests rusticity when it is found, as in this play, conjoined with the occasional appearance of a plural verb with a singular subject, C1, 2, 54 and of such solecisms as the plural possessive pronoun, there, in substitution for the singular his, 1, 3, 90 to 91, and 4, 7, 53. End of footnote. There are farcical interludes in prose, which owe their ludicrous effect to their crudity, and occasionally to their childish obscenity. Apart from its Shakespearean associations, the drama only deserves attention as a specimen of the humble average fare which commended itself to the Elizabethan playgoer. On its own merits, it is an undistinguished unit in that pedestrian category of dramatic endeavour which found in the Elizabethan playhouse singularly warm welcome even during the active careers of the Elizabethan giants of drama. Theories of Authorship there is no clue to the author's name. The play was published anonymously. External evidence is wanting, and internal evidence gives no clear guidance. 
it has long been the fantastic habit of Elizabethan critics to hang the heavy load of most of the anonymous Elizabethan drama round the necks of Marlowe, Lodge, Kidd, Peel and Green. Signs of the workmanship of one or other of these five writers have been accordingly detected in the piece before us. The argument of identification rests in this, as in other cases, on more or less arbitrary assumptions. It is based on occasional resemblances between this play and the acknowledged work of one or other of these five men in small details of construction, expression or versification. Marlowe's genius entitles him to a better fate. It is fatuous to associate his name with an effort which at no point rises to any fullness of poetic utterance. The characteristic merits of Lodge, Kidd, Peel or Green are far inferior to those of Marlowe they walk on the lower slopes of the Elizabethan Parnassus. Their dramatic work, although at times warmed by bursts of passionate fervour, lacks for the most part indubitable marks of exalted individuality. Method, thought, metre and language take through their plays the impression of a common mould cut in low relief, and the present play, like many in the massive crowd of anonymous pieces of the period, is of that widely distributed average type. The strong family likeness which characterises the inferior Elizabethan drama of both known and unknown workmanship imperils almost all deductions of identical authorship from purely internal evidence. The presence of a very extended series of definite coincidences of style can alone give weight to such inferences. No such coincidences are discernible between the old play of Lear and dramatic experiments whose authors' names are established. Scattered and disjointed analogies offer insubstantial testimony. They are no more than common labels of dramatic hackwork, which literary aspirants of limited ability produced in rare abundance during the last decade of Elizabeth's reign. It seems, moreover, hardly rational to seek the anonymous author of King Lear among writers in whose publications anonymity was habitually eschewed. When in 1594 White obtained a license for the publication of King Lear, he secured a like privilege in regard to two other plays, one by Peel and one by Green, both of which were issued with due announcement of their authorship. Nor was it the want of Kidd or Lodge, or of their publishers, to shroud in complete anonymity their literary activities. Were Green or Peel, Kidd or Lodge responsible for King Lear, the publisher is not likely to have proved false to his habitual practice and to have withheld all key to the dramatist's name from the title page. The absence of the author's name or of his initials suggests that he never emerged from a position of obscurity and that whether or no he wrote more plays than this one, he never acquired genuine fame by any. Lear and Lochrine the author may, with greatest probability, be sought among those shadowy figures who dealt with similar themes. The story of King Lear belongs to that dark age in the legendary history of Britain which preceded the Roman conquest. The mythic era supplied the fable of Gorboduc to the earliest Elizabethan tragedy, and the whole family of legends achieved peculiar popularity on the Elizabethan stage during the last decade of the 16th century. Possibly the author of King Lear may be responsible for one or two of the cognate efforts of mysterious origin which gloomily distinguished that period. Of these efforts, the most interesting on both internal and external grounds is the lamentable tragedy of Lochrine. Lochrine was a British prince who was Lear's legendary ancestor and the tragedy concerning his career was published in 1595 a year after King Lear was produced in the theatre and was first licensed for publication. Apart from the likeness of subject matter, the metrical monotony of the verse, the crude interludes of farce in prose, the tone of many classical and scriptural allusions and occasional poetic patches on their tame canvas, give a vague colour to the theory that King Lear was a first attempt in drama by the author of Locrine. Both dramatists sought their material in the same repository of fable which Geoffrey of Monmouth had brought into being. 
there is no large difference in the dramatic temper of the two pieces, and such distinctions as may be drawn may illustrate a familiar law of growth in literary art. The later piece is less constrained, is more expansive and passionate than the earlier, but the increase of power and passion may be the outcome of added experience. Unluckily, the speculation cannot yield very solid fruit, for the authorship of Lochrine is shrouded in an impenetrable mist. The title page assigns it to W.S., initials which were clearly invented by the publisher, to give the unwary reader the false impression that the play came from Shakespeare's pen. Plausible grounds have, in conformity with the inevitable custom, been advanced in favour of Green's responsibility for Lochrine, but all are of questionable validity. William Rankins Another dramatic worker in the same legendary field, who claims mention in this context, is historically in a situation which curiously reverses that of the unknown author of Lochrine. In 1598, Henslow, the theatrical manager, produced a piece called after one of Lear's most famous successors on the mythical throne of Britain, Malmutius Don Wallow. This legendary personage is reckoned to have brought to a close the internecine strife of Ferex and Porex, and to have inaugurated a new era of peace and law. The Elizabethan drama, of which Malmutius was the hero, has, less fortunate than Locrine, been lost. Yet, by way of tantalising compensation, the dramatist's name has escaped the oblivion which has overtaken the author of Locrine. Henslow declares that the writer of Malmutius Don Wallow was William Rankins, i.e. Rankins. Rankins was sole or part author, according to Henslow's record, of three other historical plays between the end of 1598 and the beginning of 601. Like Malmutius, all have vanished. In the absence of any specimens of Rankins' dramatic work, his dramatic powers can only be dimly guessed from some extant satires of more vigour than grace, and from a little occasional verse of bald simplicity. He was clearly a humble practitioner in letters, but his capacity need not have proved unequal to the task of dramatising the fables of Lear in 1594, and even of Locrine in 1595, as well as the mythical career of their descendant Malmutius Donwallow, in 1598. The suggestion is, at any rate, worth parenthetic notice. It should be added that Rankins and a friend in the same literary category as himself, Richard Hathaway, were joint authors of the lost piece about John of Gaunt's conquest of Spain, which was licensed to Edward White for publication at the same date in 1594 as King Lear, and that this historic drama was undergoing revision by the two authors at Henslow's expense, early in 1601. Rankins was at any rate an active figure in the theatrical arena, while the dramatic possibilities of the old story of King Lear were first brought to the notice of the Elizabethan public. The Legend of Geoffrey of Monmouth The fable of an aged father who divides his property among his three daughters in reward for their profession of love and then suffers a cruel disillusionment from a misinterpretation of their assurances, is a folk story of great antiquity and wide distribution. Its absorption by the legendary history of Britain can be traced to no earlier source than Geoffrey of Monmouth's twelfth-century chronicle, a massive monument of stubborn credulity. In Geoffrey's Latin history of British kings, King Lear and his daughters hold a central place. Geoffrey claims to translate British records of immemorial antiquity, but the alleged fountain of his stream of incredible information need not detain us here. It is sufficient for our present purpose to know that from the 12th to the 17th centuries, Geoffrey's fables of Lear and his line were accepted as authentic history and were in continuous process of recapitulation even to the date of Milton's death in 1674 by a succession of chroniclers and historians who enjoyed general repute. Lear and Brute Geoffrey is responsible for the strange allegation, which very long and obstinately held its ground, that Britain owed its name and the birth of its civilization 
to one brute, an imaginary grandson of Aeneas of Troy, who settled with a band of followers in the island more than two thousand years before the Christian era. Brute is credited with founding London under the name of Troyanova or Troynevant, and with begetting a long line of British kings. His son Locrine was followed in the eighth generation by Lear, son of Bladud, on whose career Geoffrey grafted the folk tale of the three daughters. Leah's royal progeny is carried by Geoffrey through six or seven further generations, until its extinction amid the fatal strife of King Gorboduc's sons, Ferex and Porex. With the deaths of these fierce warriors, a new dynasty of the same Trojan stain was inaugurated by Malmutius Donwallow, son of Cloton, Duke of Cornwall, a lawgiver after the pattern of Numa Pompilius of Rome. Malmutius's descendants supplied the throne of Britain with brave occupants for ten or more centuries. His line, which included King Lud, the renovator of London, survived the Roman occupation and became feudatory to the Roman Empire. Cymbeline, who was reckoned to be coeval with the opening of the Christian era, was Don Wallow's distant heir. Only with the invasion of the Jutes under Hengist and Horsa and the ending of the British dynasty on the passing away of King Arthur did the dominion initiated by Brute and his Trojan companions pass altogether to another race. To Geoffrey's story of the ancient and long-lived dynasty, Shakespeare owed more or less directly two of his heroes, Cymbeline as well as Lear. Lear and the Elizabethan Historians Geoffrey's legend was retold by more than fifty writers, chroniclers, historians and poets before the production of the old play concerning the Brito-Trojan King Lear. Laomon, at the end of the twelfth century, first turned the tradition into English in his poem called Brute. In the sixteenth century, Lear's tale found its appointed place in the preliminary sections of English chronicles by Fabian, Grafton, Stowe and Hollinshead and was, with its setting, very slowly dislodged from credible history. With the notable exceptions of Camden and Speed, the chief archaeologists of Shakespeare's day viewed all the details of the Trojan myth as articles of orthodox belief. Robert Greene, whose varied writings reflect with fidelity contemporary culture, seriously described in 1590 on the authority of, quote, the antiquaries, the city of London as, quote, that famous Troynevant, plotted and erected by Brute, and after famosed by King Lud and his successors, end quote. Footnote. Green's The Royal Exchange, 1590, in Prose Works, Editor, Grossart, Volume 7, page 222, end footnote. Even Milton declined to reject altogether the Trojan pedigree of the British crown. Scepticism, which found an occasional voice, was rejected as unpatriotic. Queen Elizabeth was many times saluted with the utmost gravity by literary admirers as a worthy representative of that ancient house of Troy, of which Lear, like Brute, Locrine, Bladud and Lud, was a shining ornament. Poets under James I repeatedly called the chief city of the kingdom, Troynevant, or New Troy, Thomas Decker entitled the pageant, which he devised for the entry into office of the Lord Mayor of London in 1612, Troyanova Triumphants, London Triumphing. Footnote. During Henry VIII's reign, Polydor Virgil denied the existence of Brute and his family, and denounced as a credulous invention the whole pedigree of British kings. Polydor had early disciples, nearly all of whom were of foreign or Scottish origin, and their scepticism was assigned to racial envy. The Scottish historian and poet George Buchanan was among the adverse critics. At the extreme end of Elizabeth's reign, the sceptical argument won respectful attention at home from Camden and Speed, but the old story still held its ground in England, even in the scholarly circle of which Sir Henry Saville was an ornament. The authenticity of the story of Lear and his ancestry was strenuously defended by Richard Harvey, Gabriel Harvey's brother, in Philadelphus, or a defence of Brutes and the Bruton's History, 
1593, of which the dedication was accepted by Robert Devereux, Earl of Essex, the Queen's favourite. The poet Drayton pursued a middle course, and in the introduction to his Polyolbion, 1622, maintained, quote, as an advocate for the muse, end quote, the Cambro-Britain traditions of the Trojan settlers, though he admitted historic difficulties. It is curious to notice how closely Milton's attitude resembled Drayton's. In his History of Britain, he acknowledges the growth of doubt respecting Brute and his dynasty, but declines to abandon the story on the ground that it still enjoyed the approval of men, quote, not unread nor unlearned in antiquity, end quote, and that its conservation was, quote, in favour of our English poets and rhetoricians, who by their art will know how to use them, the stories, judiciously, end quote. The tale of Lear is related by Milton in full detail in its legendary cycle. C.F. Milton as a Historian by Professor C. H. Firth in the Proceedings of the British Academy, Volume 3, 1908. End of footnote. Lear and the Elizabethan Epic Wherever the Trojan myth spread, the memory of Lear was known and honoured. The epic poets of the Elizabethan era showed no less zeal than the chroniclers in tracing through the ages the royal progress of the British Trojans. And although they were eclectic in their choice of episodes, they invariably retold the legend of Lear and his daughters. In 1586, William Warner, in his Albion's England, a rambling poetic chronicle from the time of Noah to, in its original form, that of William the Conqueror, gleaned much from Geoffrey of Monmouth and his followers, and laid stress on Lear's tragic history. Book 3, Chapter 14 A year later, the mirror for magistrates embodied in its selected tragedies of early Britain a long and piteous autobiography of Cordelia, King Lear's youngest daughter. Similarly, the greatest of Elizabethan epic poets, Edmund Spencer, devoted a canto of his fairy queen to the Trojan myth, and dwelt, with pathetic sympathy, on the sufferings of the aged monarch and his youngest child. Footnote. Sir Gion, in the second book of the Fairy Queen, Canto 10, reads an, quote, ancient book, Height Britain Monuments, end quote, which gives an account of the British kings from Brute to Uther, father of King Arthur. King Lear's experiences fill six stanzas, 27 to 32. The version of the story by Warner, which is not very accessible and is a chief source of the old play, is reprinted in an appendix to this volume. End of footnote. The Brito-Trojan Kings and the Elizabethan Drama The birth of Elizabethan drama was contemporaneous with an uprising of national feeling. The drama sought a vast amount of its early sustenance from the early records of national history. The history play was the most popular item in the repertory of the Elizabethan theatrical manager. In view of the habitual attitude of historical and epic writers, the dramatist and his audience were not likely to draw any fine distinction between insubstantial legend and attested fact. The heroes of the Trojan dynasty were consequently pressed into the theatrical service with the same energy and enthusiasm as the Plantagenets or early Tudor sovereigns. The adventures of King Gorboduc of the Trojan line and of his quarrelsome sons Ferex and Porrex formed the topics of the first regular English tragedy. Before the end of the 16th century, Brute, Locrine, Malmutius, Donwallow, Elidure, King Lud, all joined King Lear in seeking on the Elizabethan stage the suffrages of the playgoer. The experiences of Uther Pendragon his son, King Arthur, Merlin, Vortigern, Hengist, Caradoc, great personages who were assigned to the extreme close of the primeval age of Britain, were also approved themes of contemporary dramatic effort. Footnote. Of the twelve pieces indicated in the text, only six dealing with the stories of Locrine, Lear, Elidur, King Arthur, Merlin and Caradoc survive in print. The plays about Elidor and Caradoc were called respectively Nobody and Somebody, No Date, and The Valiant Welshman, 
1615. Henslow attests in his diary the performance of the other cited plays, none of which survive. Distinction should be drawn between the life and death of King Arthur, which Henslow notices as a lost work of Richard Hathaway, and a piece on the same subject, The Misfortunes of Arthur, by Thomas Hughes and others, which is extant in an edition of 1587. The whole subject is ably treated by Professor Felix Schelling in the English Chronicle Play, New York, 1902. End of footnote. The Descent of the Lear Story The story of King Lear underwent singularly little change as it passed through the ages from pen to pen of chronicler or poet. Footnote. A valuable account of the descent of the story of King Lear through English literature from Geoffrey of Monmouth to Shakespeare is given by Dr. Wilfrid Perrett in Palestra, Volume 35, Berlin, 1904 under the title of The Story of King Lear from Geoffrey of Monmouth to Shakespeare. Dr. Perrett enumerates 52 writers who retold Geoffrey of Monmouth's story before 1594, the date of the old play's composition. The differences are small. Dr. Perrett's analysis of the old play of King Lear and of Shakespeare's tragedy of the same name brings out many important details touching the sources of the two dramatists' information. The present edition of the old play stands indebted to Dr. Perrett's careful researches at many points. End of footnote. Such minor modifications as the legend experienced in its long descent from the 12th to the 16th century seem due to casual errors of transcription. It is improbable that the old dramatist had recourse to any earlier narrative than that of his contemporary Hollinshead or that he placed reliance on any additional sources of information, save the poetic versions in Albion's England, the Mirror for Magistrates, and the Fairy Queen. But although he confined his research to books of his own epoch, his play involuntarily reproduces, without essential qualification, the original story of Geoffrey of Monmouth. On the small points in which Geoffrey is at variance with his imitators, the old dramatist echoes the notes of Hollinshead, or one of the three Elizabethan poets. The old dramatist's use of his authorities. Much difference exists in the literature of Lear respecting the titles of the husbands of the king's two unfilial daughters. The majority follow Geoffrey in calling Goneril's husband Duke of Albany, i.e. Scotland, and Regan's husband Duke of Cornwall. Shakespeare is faithful to this nomenclature. Hollinshead reverses the husband's titles, associating Goneril's married life with the ruler of Cornwall and Regan's with that of Albany. The old dramatist adopts Hollinshead's suggestion as far as Goneril is concerned and bestows her hand in marriage on the king of Cornwall. But he seeks in Spencer, who therein differs from all his predecessors, the title of king of Cambria for the husband of Regan. The old dramatist, in fact, improved on Spencer by giving the King of Cambria the added Christian name of Morgan, which has no authority. This variation may be attributed to the peculiarly close juxtaposition in the Mirror for Magistrates of the traditional story of a personage of this name, who figured in the ancient narrative as the son of the daughter Goneril and a successor of Cordula on the British throne. To Spencer again, the old dramatist seems to owe another original variation on the archetype, which makes Lear's two unfilial daughters cast lots as to which part of their father's kingdom shall fall to each. In the standard version, Lear makes the division on his sole and unprompted authority. Footnote. Spencer's employment in his version of the somewhat unusual words regiment, i.e. dominion, and grutch, i.e. complain, is adopted in the old play. See Glossary. See also notes on 1, 3, 78, 119 to 120, 2, 1, 4. End of footnote. The debt, however, to Warner's epic treatment of the fable seems larger than to Spencer's. From Warner comes the form Cordella for the name of the king's youngest daughter, as well as the appellation the Gallian King, for Cordella's husband. 
Many phrases, too, in the old play echo the language of Warner's Albion's England. Footnote. See notes on 1, 1, 42, 1, 3, 93 to 94, 2, 2, 59 to 60, 3, 3, 43 to 46. End of footnote. Warner, moreover, alone gave the hint, which the old dramatist liberally expanded, of the eldest daughter's unfilial attempt on the old king's life. Original Developments But in spite of the dramatist's fidelity to the main features of the tradition, he must be allowed ingenuity in stretching the scanty material which the old story offered to the full limits of a five-act drama. Judged by a Shakespearean standard, the old dramatist is a clumsy and perfunctory manipulator of the bare motives and actions of the medieval legend. But if we strictly compare his adaptation to the exclusion of Shakespeare with any earlier treatment of the theme in prose or poetry, we cannot deny him a fertility of invention which issues in an astonishing advance on preceding efforts. He infuses a touch of living colour into more than one character or incident, of which there is the merest hint in the earlier narratives. Elsewhere, wholly new characters and incidents lend the tale a variety which lies outside the scope of the ancient tradition. Perilous. Of original embellishments, by far the most important is the character of Perilous, the old king's faithful companion. No such character figures in the current versions of the legend. Geoffrey of Monmouth vaguely notes that one knight attended the old king on his escape from England to his youngest daughter's home in France. All his followers had deserted him, excepto quodam amigero. In the Gesta Romanorum alone, of all succeeding recensions, is this feature of the tale repeated. There, a single squire attends Lear on his arrival in France. But it may well be doubted whether such slender hints can be held responsible for the old dramatist's presentment of the deserted king's devoted servant. Perilous, in the old play, is to a far greater degree than his analogue, Kent, in Shakespeare's tragedy, one of the pillars of the action. There is point and freshness about the courtier's independence and self-respecting loyalty, which stiffen the whole dramatic fabric. Perilous's frank rebuke of King Lear's moral blindness in the opening scenes, and his subsequent companionship of his old master in his lonely wanderings, give the fable a glow of humanity which would otherwise be wanting. Another new character is Scaliger, the disingenuous counsellor of the aged king, who first suggests the division of his property. He is sketched in far more slender outline than Perilous, but a substantial indication is given, as the old play progresses, of the conflict in a vulgar mind between self-interest and loyalty. Although a child of the old dramatist's fancy, there possibly went to his making a vague word in Warner's Albion's England, where the old king exclaims in the distress of his abandonment, quote, Bid non affi in friends. The legendary dramatis personae are invariably confined to the old king and his three daughters and their three husbands. A third character, who is first grafted on the old story by the dramatist, is the Gallian king's bluff, breezy-tempered companion, Mumford, who is as brave a soldier as the bastard in King John, and is cast in the same mould. Other new characters include apart from subsidiary figures like the crude-witted watchman and captains, the unprincipled messenger who is commissioned by Goneril to murder her injured father. This, quote, shag-haired murdering wretch, 5-4-184, plays a part of some importance in the development of the plot. He is a careless villain of that conventional type which was dear to embryonic drama. A slight attempt is also made by the old dramatist for the first time to invest with individuality the characters of the unfilial daughter's husbands. Their denunciation of the cruel callousness of their wives is an original and human touch. The New Nomenclature The nomenclature of the three wholly original characters of chief importance, Perilous, Scaliger and Mumford, betrays wild incoherence. Perilous is known to classical literature 
notably to Ovid and Pliny, as the inventor for the tyrant Phalaris of a brazen instrument of torture shaped like a bull, of which he was condemned by the patron to be the first victim. Footnote. For Ovid's mention of Perilous, see R. Samatoria, 1, 653, in Holland's translation of Pliny's Natural History, 1634, page 504, the story of Perilous runs thus. Quote, As for Perilous, there is no man commendeth him for his workmanship, but holdeth him more cruel than Phalaris the tyrant, who set him a work, for that he devised a brazen bull to roast and fry condemned persons. In assuring the tyrant that after the fire was made under it, they would, when they cried, seem to bellow like a bull, and so rather make sport than move compassion. But this perilous was the first himself that gave the hansel to the engine of his own invention, and although this was cruelty in the tyrant, yet surely such a workman deserved no better a reward, and justly he felt the smart of it. End quote. Perilous's story is also told in the popular medieval collection of stories, Gesta Romanorum, number 48, though it only figures in the Latin version and is absent from the early English translations. Gower, in his Confessio Amantis, lines 3295, sec, also narrates the adventures of Perilous, though he misspells the name Berilus. Perilous is to be distinguished from Perellus, a notorious lawyer and usurer of Rome, whom Horace mentions in Satires 3, line 75. End of footnote. Even less rational seems the bestowal of the designation Scaliger, S-K-A-L-L-I-G-E-R, on Leah's less reputable counsellor. The name seems only known elsewhere, as that of two great scholars of the Renaissance, in the familiar form Scaliger, S-C-A-L-I-G-E-R. The elder Scaliger's monumental treatise on the art of poetry was a textbook of scholarship in England and on the European continent through great part of the 16th and 17th centuries. Mumford, the Gallian king's companion, is christened with no greater propriety. The word is a variant of the more familiar form Mountfort or Mountford. Employing a conventional pun, the character remarks, I am kin to the blunts, and I think the bluntest of all my kindred. Therefore, if I be too blunt with you, thank yourself for praying me to be so. 2 1 44 to 47. The great Elizabethan family of the Blounts enjoyed the baronial title of Mountjoy, to which a mysterious allusion is possibly made there. On the other hand, the dramatist may be merely illustrating an irresponsible vein of frivolity. Footnote. The jest on the surname Blount is repeated in Thomas Thorpe's dedication of Marlowe's translation of the first book of Lucan, 1600, to his friend Edward Blount. Quote, Blount, I purpose to be blunt with you. End quote. The old dramatist indulges in many unimpressive puns of like calibre. CF 2 4 126. Quote, Cordella, cordial to my heart. And 4 8 13. Quote, to hop without her hope. End, quote. End of footnote. The courtship of Cordella. Of the new incidents grafted by the dramatist on the legend, the episode of the French king's hasty courtship of Cordella is most notable. Dismissed from her father's house on the day of her two sisters' weddings, King Lear's youngest daughter unexpectedly meets on the highway two men in the guise of palmers or pilgrims. One of the wayfarers makes love to her, and she accepts his offer of marriage. Neither knows the other's rank. Her lover proves to be the King of Gallia, who, with his light-hearted friend and courtier, Mumford, has come to Britain on a frolic. Disguised as pilgrims or palmers, they are bent on paying their addresses to fair British girls. Cordella's marriage is solemnised after due recognition without delay. Nowhere else does the matrimonial career of Cordella begin so unceremoniously. The normal version, as supplied by Hollinshead, shows how one of the princes of Gallia, 
hearing of Cordelia's, quote, beauty, womanhood, and good conditions, sent her father an offer of marriage, end quote. Lear answered, quote, that the prince might have his daughter, but as for any dower he could have none, for all was promised and assured to her other sisters already, end quote. This reply carried no weight with the prince, who took Cordelia, quote, to wife, only moved thereto, I say, for respect of her person and amiable virtues, end quote. The old dramatist has substituted for this tame solicitation the crudely comic episode of an accidental and unpremeditated courtship. Most of the striking features of the wanderings of Lear after his banishment by his daughters are likewise an invention of the old dramatist. The messenger's threat of murder may have been suggested by Warner, but the cruel thunderstorm, which, while it shakes the villain's nerve, exposes King Lear to terrible suffering, is due to no earlier version. The details of the meeting and reconciliation of Lear with his youngest daughter, and the old man's remorseful obeisances, completely reconstruct a very bald passage in the traditional story. The Ending of the Play The ending of the old play follows the authentic legend without modification. Lear, after seeking asylum in France with his youngest daughter, returns to England with her and her husband at the head of an armed force. War is declared on Goneril and Regan, and on their husbands, and the rout of the latter's armies brings the drama to its close. The unfilial daughters leave the scene alive, but ruined. No character suffers death. Lear is restored to his throne amid the rejoicings of Cordella and the Gallian king. The old dramatist ignores any later episodes of the old story, which tells how Lear reigned three years after his triumphs, and was then succeeded by Cordella. How five years later Queen Cordella was driven from her throne by Morgan, son of her sister Goneril, and how she finally committed suicide in prison. Footnote. In Spencer's Fairy Queen, 2, 10, 32, the traditional account of Cordelia's restoration of her father and of her own unhappy end in a subsequent year runs thus. Quote, so to his, Leah's, crown, she, Cordelia, him restored again, in which he died, made ripe for death by Eld, and after willed it should to her remain, who peaceably the same long time did weld, and all men's hearts in due obedience held till that her sister's children, waxen strong, through proud ambition against her rebelled, and overcome, kept in prison long, till weary of that wretched life, herself she hung. End, quote. End of footnote. The old dramatist gives an indication that he was acquainted with the later narrative of Cordelia's career by employing the name Morgan, but it remained for Shakespeare to associate the old king with his youngest daughter's death, and thus convert Leah's fate into inexorable tragedy. Footnote. The 17th century ballad, entitled A Lamentable Song of the Death of King Lear and His Three Daughters, closes like Shakespeare's tragedy with the deaths of Lear and his youngest daughter, who is called Cordelia by the ballad maker. The date of the ballad is uncertain, and some controversy has arisen over the question whether it were penned before or after Shakespeare's play. The balance of evidence seems against the priority of the ballad. It was printed for the first time in 1620 in Richard Johnson's Golden Garlands of Princely Pleasures and Delicate Delights. The only copy of the book which appears to be known is in the British Museum, and it is described on the title page as the third edition but there is ground for believing that the book had not appeared before in any issue of earlier date. The ballad treats the main events of the Lear legend after the manner of Warner or Hollinshead. The only divergence concerns the catastrophe which there is good reason to regard as borrowed from Shakespeare's tragedy. The ballad which Dr. Perrett carefully reprints from Johnson's volume, Palestra, 35, pages 125 to 142, has small pertinence to a study of the old play. End of footnote. Shakespeare's Treatment of the Old Drama 
it may be admitted that in the absence of the old play, Shakespeare might well have detected in the legend all the tragic potency which he ultimately drew from it. Shakespeare refashioned and strengthened the great issues of the plot by methods which lay wholly outside the old dramatist's capacity. There is no trace of Lear's fool in any earlier version. Shakespeare, too, sought an entirely new complication for the story by grafting on it complementarily the by-plot of the Duke of Gloucester and his sons, which he drew from a wholly different source, Sir Philip Sidney's Arcadia. Nor was he satisfied with the catastrophe of the chronicles which contented the earlier dramatist. The restoration of Lear to his forsaken throne at the hands of Cordelia and her husband, the Gallian king, was rejected for the defeat of the foreign invaders and for the death of Lear and Cordelia. But it remains manifest, none the less, that the great dramatist owed to his humble predecessor numerous suggestions which he frankly adopted. Indeed, many of the humanising touches which the old dramatist imported into the legend became the main basis of Shakespeare's mighty superstructure. This admission does not underrate the larger metamorphosis which Shakespeare's unapproachable tragic gift wrought in the whole scheme of the fable. It merely acknowledges a biological process. Kent and Perilous Kent is Shakespeare's most conspicuous debt to the old play. Kent's character and action reproduce, albeit with heightened emotion, the old dramatist's conception of Perilous. The change of name and the presentation of Lear's companion as a man young enough to be his son, instead of his own age, as in the old play, leave untouched the essential points of resemblance. Hardly any of the speeches which Perilous and Lear address to one another fail to yield suggestion to Shakespeare. Perilous's stirring appeal to his sovereign to cancel his condemnation of Cordelia is met by the old king with these lines, 2 3, 99 to 103. Urge this no more, and if thou love thy life, I say she is no daughter that doth scorn to tell her father how he loveth him. Whoever speaketh hereof to me again, I will esteem him for my mortal foe. In Shakespeare's play, the echo of these words is distinctly audible in the passionate denunciation of Kent by Lear in the opening scene, with its issue in Kent's banishment under threat of death. King Lear, 1, 1, 112, sec. Peace, Kent, come not between the dragon and his wrath. I loved her most. Kent, on thy life no more. In the old play, Perilous is not punished for his protest by banishment, but he absents himself from the court and does not meet his old master again until his unfilial daughters have thrust the king from their doors. Then he offers his companionship to the royal vagrant, who accepts it without recognising his old courtier. Shakespeare again adapted that episode to his purpose. Despairingly does Lear address Perilous, 3, 3, 79 to 88, thus. Nay, if thou talk of reason, then be mute. What reason moveth thee to sorrow for me? These lines give the obvious cue to the famous speech of Shakespeare's king, 2, 4, 267, sec. O reason, not the need, etc. Similarly, on Perilous's description of his heartbroken master, Lear, 3, 1, 12 to 13, but he, the mirror of all mild patience, puts up all wrongs and never gives reply. Shakespeare founded Lear's piteous speech to the fool. No, I will be the pattern of all patience. I will say nothing. Lear 3, 2, 37. On no other character in the old play does Shakespeare levy so many loans as on Perilous. But further proofs of contact, although of smaller interest, abound. The humanity of Goneril's husband, the Duke of Albany, is drawn from the old dramatist's hint. There is a reminiscence of Scaliger in the fool's otherwise inexplicable reference, 1, 4, 139, 2. That lord that counselled thee to give away thy land. No lord gives such counsel to Lear in Shakespeare's play. 
It was the advice with which the old dramatist credited Scaliger, whose time-serving propensities helped to generate the wicked civility of Goneril's servant, Oswald. Something of the stage business, which is associated in Shakespeare's tragedy with the exchange of letters, e.g., between Regan and Goneril, 4282, Kent and Cordelia, 4311, Sec, and Goneril and Edmund, 45, Passim, seems traceable to the interception by Goneril in the old play of letters addressed to Leah, 3545, Sec, and to the passage of letters between Regan and Goneril, 43, Passim. Regan's angry outburst of unfilial heartlessness on reading Goneril's written complaint of the old king's, quote, presumption, 4314, Sec, may have given the cue to the splendid outcry in Shakespeare's piece of filial sympathy, to which Cordelia gives passionate utterance on receiving Kent's written report of her father's distresses. 4, 3, 11 to 34. Other of Shakespeare's adaptations. In Lear's terrible curse of Goneril, strike her young bones with lameness. King Lear 2, 4, 165. Shakespeare adapts from the old piece Lear's taunting allusion to Goneril's, quote, young bones, i.e., unborn child, King Lear, 3, 3, 27. Another borrowed feature of great impressiveness is the thunderstorm which is the grimmest of all Lear's tortures in both pieces. So again, Lear's twice-repeated offer at the close to kneel for pardon at the feet of his injured daughter Cordelia is an inspiration of Shakespeare's predecessor. Footnote. CF, King Lear, 5-4, 203 to 206. Cordella. But look, dear father, look, behold and see, thy loving daughter speaketh unto thee. She kneels. Lear. O oh, stand thou up, it is my part to kneel, and ask forgiveness for my former faults. He rises at his daughter's entreaty, only to, quote, kneel again till pardon be resigned. End quote. Stage directions appended to this passage twice enjoin on the old man the act of kneeling. So in Shakespeare's King Lear four seven fifty seven to fifty nine, Cordelia says to her father, "O oh, look upon me, sir, and hold your hand in benediction o'er me. No, sir, you must not kneel." Again five three ten to eleven, Lear exclaims in his daughter's ear. When thou dost ask me blessing, I'll kneel down and ask of thee forgiveness. End of footnote. The greatness and the glory of Shakespeare's achievement may depend little on these comparatively minor details. Shakespeare passed far beyond the bounds marked out by the older hand. His powers through the tragedy are always mounting until they finally gain almost celestial heights. The historic tradition of Cordelia's latest years and her suicide in prison may have weighed with Shakespeare in framing his last scenes. But in his exalted conception of the reason and manner of her death, he obeyed, if anywhere, the clear untutored call of his genius. There the old drama could give him small help. The intensity of his tragic power through the concluding acts of King Lear is all his own. The final goal of the tragedy was reached without appeal to external aid. Nevertheless, the old dramatist deserves a reverent commemoration as the guide of Shakespeare's steps in the first stages of his impressive journey, which ended in the apotheosis of King Lear and his daughter. End of Introduction to the Chronicle History of King Lear and His Three Daughters by Sidney Lee Read by Phil Benson The True Chronicle History of King Lear and His Three Daughters, Goneril, Regan, and Cordella, as it hath been divers and sundry times lately acted. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Dramatis Personae King Lear, King of Britain Read by Algy Pug Scaliger, King Lear's Counselor Read by Capricia Page Perilous, King Lear's Counselor Read by Todd The Gallian King, King of France, Husband of Cordella Read by Alan Wayman Mumford, the Gallian King's Attendant Read by David Warner The King of Cornwall, Husband of Goneril Read by G. M. Preswara Morgan, King of Cambria, Husband of Regan Read by Alan Mapstone Servant to the King of Cornwall Read by Lambda Servant to the King of Cambria Read by Phil Bansom Messenger, or murderer, in the service of Goneril. Read by Martin Geeson. Ambassador from Gallia to Britain. Read by Elizabeth Clatt. First Mariner. Read by Lambda. Second Mariner. Read by Phil Bansom. Captain of the Watch. Read by Dustin Tuttle. First Watchman. Read by Alan Wayman. Second Watchman. Read by Algie Pug. First British Captain. Read by Dustin Tuttle. Second British Captain. Read by Phil Bansom. Goneril, eldest daughter of King Lear, wife of the King of Cornwall. Read by Grace Garrett. Regan, second daughter of King Lear, wife of the King of Cambria. Read by Charlotte Duckett. Cordella, youngest daughter of King Lear, Wife of the Gallian King. Read by Libby Gone. Noblemen and Nobles. Read by Ariel Lipshaw. Narrator. Read by Algie Pug. Scene. Britain, Cambria, Cornwall and Gallia. End of Dramatis Personae. Act 1. Scene 1. Presence Chamber in King Lear's Palace at Troy Navant. Enter King Lear. Scaliger, Perilous, and Nobles. Thus to our grief the obsequies performed of our too late deceased and dearest queen, whose soul, I hope, possessed of heavenly joys, doth ride in triumph amongst the cherubims. Let us request your grave advice, my lords, for the disposing of our princely daughters for whom our care is specially employed, as nature bindeth, to advance their states, in royal marriage with some princely mates, for wanting now their mother's good advice, and to whose government they have received a perfect pattern of a virtuous life, left, as it were, a ship without a stern, or a silly sheep without a pastor's care, although ourselves do dearly tender them, yet are we ignorant of their affairs for fathers best do know how to govern sons but daughter steps the mother's counsel turns a son we want for to succeed our crown and course of time hath cancelled the date of further issue from our withered loins one foot already hangeth in the grave and age hath made deep furrows in my face the world of me I of the world am weary, and I would fain resign these earthly cares, and think upon the welfare of my soul, which by no better means may be effected than by resigning up the crown from me in equal dowry to my daughters three. A worthy care, my liege, which well declares the zeal you bear our quondam queen, and since your grace hath licensed me to speak, I censure thus. Your Majesty, knowing well what several suitors your princely daughters have, to make them each a jointure more or less, as is their worth, to them that love profess. No more, nor less, but even all alike, my zeal is fixed, old-fashioned, in one mould. Wherefore, unpartial shall my censure be, both old and young shall have alike for me. My gracious lord, 
I heartily do wish that God had lent you an heir indubitate, which might have set upon your royal throne when fates should loose the prison of your life, by whose succession all this doubt might cease, and as by you, by him we might have peace. But after wishes ever come too late, and nothing can revoke the course of fate, wherefore, my liege, my censure deems it best, to match them with some of your neighbour kings, bordering within the bounds of Albion, by whose united friendship this our state may be protected against all foreign hate. Herein, my lords, your wishes sought with mine, and mine, I hope, do sought with heavenly powers, for at this instant two near neighbouring kings, of Cornwall and of Cambria, motion love towards my two daughters, Goneril and Regan. My youngest daughter, fair Cordella, vows no liking to a monarch unless love allows she is solicited by david's peers but none of them her partial fancy hears yet if my policy may her beguile i'll match her to some king within this isle and so establish such a perfect peace as fortune's force shall ne'er prevail to cease of us and ours your gracious care my lord deserves an everlasting memory to be enrolled in chronicles of fame by never dying perpetuity yet to become so provident a prince lose not the title of a loving father do not force love where fancy cannot dwell lest dreams being stopped above the banks do swell i am resolved and even now my mind doth meditate a sudden stratagem to try which of my daughters loves me best which till i know i cannot be in rest this granted when they jointly shall contend each to exceed the other in their love then at the vantage will i take cordella even as she doth protest she loves me best i'll say then daughter grant me one request to show thou lovest me as thy sisters do except a husband whom myself will woo this said she cannot well deny my suit although poor soul her senses will be mute then will i triumph in my policy and match her with the king of brittany i'll to them before and bewray your secrecy thus fathers think their children to beguile and oft times themselves do first repent when heavenly powers do frustrate their intent exeunt act one scene two a room in king lear's palace Enter Goneril and Regan. I marvel, Regan, how you can endure to see that proud pert Pete, our youngest sister, so slightly to account of us, her elders, as if we were no better than herself. We cannot have a quaint device so soon, or new-made fashion of our choice invention, but if she like it, she will have the same, or study newer to exceed us both. What should I do? Would it were in my power to find a cure for this contagious ill? Some desperate medicine must be soon applied to dim the glory of her mounting fame. Else it be long, she'll have both prick and praise, and we must be set by for working days. Do you not see what several choice of suitors she daily hath, and of best degree? Say, amongst all, she'll hap to fancy one, and have a husband when as we have none. Why then, by right to her we must give place, though it be ne'er so much to our disgrace. By my virginity, rather than she shall have a husband before me, I'll marry one or other in his shirt. And yet I have made half a grant already of my good will unto the King of Cornwall. So I not so deeply, sister, here cometh my Lord Scaliger. Something his hasty coming doth import. Enter Scaliger. Sweet princesses, I am glad I met you here so luckily, having good news which doth concern you both, and— craveth speedy expedition for god's sake tell us what it is my lord i am with child until you utter it madam to save your longing this it is your father in great secrecy to-day told me he means to marry you out of hand unto the noble prince of cambria you madam to the king of cornwall's grace your younger sister he would fain bestow upon the rich king of hibernia but that he doubts she hardly will consent for hitherto she ne'er could fancy him if she do yield why then 
between you three, he will divide his kingdom for your dowries. But yet there is a further mystery, which so you will conceal, I will disclose. Whatever thou speakest to us, kind Scaliger, think that thou speakest it only to thyself. He earnestly desireth for to know which of you three do bear most love to him, and on your loves he so extremely dotes, as never any did I think before. He presently doth mean to send for you, to be resolved of this tormenting doubt. And look, whose answer pleaseth him the best, they shall have most under their marriages. Oh, that I had some pleasing mermaid's voice, for to enchant his senseless senses with. For he supposeth that Cordelia will, striving to go beyond you in her love, promise to do whatever he desires. Then he will straight enjoin her, for his sake, the Hibernian king to marry for to take. This is the sum of all I have to say, which being done, I humbly take my leave, not doubting but your wisdoms will foresee what course will best unto your good agree. Thanks, gentle Scaliger. Thy kindness undeserved shall not be unrequited if we live. Exit Scaliger. Now we have fit occasion offered us to be revenged upon her unperceived. Nay, our revenge we will inflict on her shall be accounted piety in us. I will so flatter with my doting father, as he was ne'er so flattered in his life. Nay, I will say, that if it be his pleasure to match me to a beggar, I will yield. For why, I know whatever I do say, he means to match me with the Cornwall king. I'll say the like, for I am well assured. Whate'er I say to please the old man's mind, who doubts as if he were a child again, I shall enjoy the noble Cambrian prince. Only, to feed his humour, will suffice to say, I am content with any one whom he'll appoint me. This will please him more than e'er Apollo's music pleased Jove. Oh, I smile to think in what a woeful plight Cordella will be when we answer thus, for she will rather die than give consent to join in marriage with the Irish king. So will our father think she loveth him not, because she will not grant to his desire, which we will aggravate in such bitter terms that he will soon convert his love to hate, for he, you know, is always in extremes. Not all the world could lay a better plot. I long till it be put into practice. Exeunt. Act One, Scene Three. Presence Chamber in King Lear's Palace. Enter Lear and Perilous. Perilous, go seek my daughters. Will them immediately come and speak with me? I will, my gracious lord. Exit. Oh, what a combat feels my panting heart! Twixt children's love and care of common weal. How dear my daughters are unto my soul, None knows but he that knows my thoughts and secret deeds. Ah, little do they know the dear regard, Wherein I hold their future state to come. And when they securely sleep on beds of down, These aged eyes do watch for their behalf while they like wanton sport in youthful toys this throbbing heart is pierced with dire annoys as doth the sun exceed the smallest star so doth the father's love exceed the child's yet my complaints are causeless for the world affords not children more conformable and yet methinks my mind presageth still i know not what and yet I fear some ill. Enter Perilous with the three daughters. Well, here my daughters come. I have found out a present means to rid me of this doubt. Our royal lord and father, in all duty we come to know the tenor of your will. Why you so hastily have sent for us? Dear Goneril, kind Regan, sweet Cordella, ye flourishing branches of a kingly stock, sprung from a tree that once did flourish green whose blossoms now are nipped with winter's frost and pale grim death doth wait upon my steps and summons me unto his next assizes therefore dear daughters as ye tender the safety of him that was the cause of your first being 
resolve a doubt which much molests my mind which of you three to me would prove most kind which loves me most and which at my request would soonest yield unto their father's hest i hope my gracious father makes no doubt of any of his daughter's love to him yet for my part to show my zeal to you which cannot be in windy words rehearsed i prize my love to you at such a rate i think my life inferior to my love should you enjoin me for to tie a millstone about my neck and leap into the sea at your command i willingly would do it yea for to do you good i would ascend the highest turret in all brittany and from the top leap headlong to the ground nay more should you appoint me for to marry the meanest vassal in the spacious world without reply i would accomplish it in brief command whatever you desire and if i fail no favour i require oh how thy words revive my dying soul oh how i do abhor this flattery but what saith regan to her father's will oh that my simple utterance could suffice to tell the true intention of my heart which burns in zeal of duty to your grace and never can be quenched but by desire to show the same in outward forwardness oh that there be some other maid that durst but make challenge of her love with me i'd make her soon confess she never loved her father half so well as i do you ay then my deed should prove in plainer case how much by zeal aboundeth to your grace but for them all let this one mean suffice to ratify my love before your eyes i have right noble suitors to my love no worse than kings and haply i love one yet would you have me make my choice in you i'd bridle fancy and be ruled by you did never philomel sing so sweet a note did never flatterer tell so false a tale speak now cordella make my joys at full and drop down nectar from thy honey lips i cannot paint my duty forth in words i hope my deed shall make report for me but look what love the child doth owe the father the same to you i bear my gracious lord here is an answer answerless indeed were you my daughter i should scarcely brook it dost thou not blush proud peacock as thou art to make our father such a slight reply why how now minion are you grown so proud doth thou dear love make you thus peremptory what is your love become so small to us as that you scorn to tell us what it is do you love us as every child doth love their father true indeed as some who by disobedience shot their father's days and so would you some are so father sick that they would make means to rid them from the world and so would you some are indifferent whether their aged parents live or die and so are you but didst thou know proud girl what care i had to foster thee to this ah then thou wouldst say as thy sisters do our life is less than love we owe to you dear father do not so mistake my words nor my plain meaning be so misconstrued my tongue was never used to flattery you were best not to say i flatter if you do my deeds shall show i flatter not with you i love my father better than thou canst the praise were great spoke from another's mouth but it should seem your neighbours dwell far off nay here is one that will confirm as much as she has said both for myself and her i say thou dost not wish my father's good dear father peace bastard imp no issue of king lear i will not hear thee speak one tittle more call me not father if thou love thy life nor these thy sisters once presume to name look for no help henceforth from me nor mine shift as thou wilt and trust unto thyself my kingdom will i equally divide twixt thy two sisters to their royal dower and will bestow them worthy their deserts this done because thou shalt not have the hope to have a child's part in the time to come i presently will dispossess myself and set up these upon my princely throne i ever thought that pride would have a fall plain dealing sister your beauty is so sheen 
You need no dowry to make you be a queen. Exeunt Lear, Goneril, Regan. Now, whither, poor forsaken, shall I go, When mine own sisters triumph in my woe? But unto him which doth protect the just, In him will poor Cordella put her trust. These hands shall labour for to get my spending, And so I live until my days have ending. Exit. Oh, how I grieve to see my lord thus fond, to dote so much upon vain flattering words. Ah, if he but with good advice had weighed the hidden tenor of her humble speech, reasons to rage should not have given place, nor poor Cordelia suffer such disgrace. Exit. End of Act One. Act Two of The True Chronicle History of King Lear and His Three Daughters, Goneril, Regan, and Cordella, by Anonymous. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Scene One The Palace of the Galleon King. Enter the Galleon King with Mumford and three nobles more. Dissuade me not, my lords, I am resolved this next fair wind to sail for Brittany, in some disguise, to see if flying fame be not too prodigal in the wondrous praise of these three nymphs, the daughters of King Lear. If present view do answer absent praise, and eyes allow of what our ears have heard, and Venus stand auspicious to my vows, and fortune favour what I take in hand, I will return seized of as rich a prize as Jason when he won the Golden Fleece. Heavens grant you may. The match were full of honour, and well beseeming the young Gallian king. I would your grace would favour me so much, as make me partner of your pilgrimage. I long to see the gallant British dames, and feed mine eyes upon their rare perfections. For till I know the contrary, I'll say, our dames in France are far more fair than they. Lord Mumford, you have saved me a labour in offering that which I did mean to ask, and I most willingly accept your company. Yet first I will enjoin you to observe some few conditions which I shall propose. So that you do not tie mine eyes for looking after the amorous glances of fair dames, so that you do not tie my tongue from speaking, my lips from kissing, when occasion serves, my hands from congees, and my knees to bow to gallant girls, which were a task more hard than flesh and blood is able to endure. Command what else you please. I rest content. To bind thee from a thing thou canst not leave were but a mean to make thee seek it more, and therefore speak, look, kiss, salute for me. In these myself am like to second thee. Now hear thy task. I charge thee from the time that first we set sail for the British shore, to use no words of dignity to me, but in the friendliest manner that thou canst make use of me as thy companion, for we will go disguised in palmer's weeds, that no man shall mistrust us what we are. If that be all, I'll fit your turn, I warrant you. I am some kin to the blunts, and, I think, the bluntest of all my kindred. Therefore, if I be too blunt with you, thank yourself for praying me to be so. Thy pleasant company will make the way seem short. It resteth now that in my absence hence I do commit the government to you, my trusty lords and faithful counsellors. Time cutteth off the rest, I have to say. The wind blows fair, and I must needs away. Heaven send your voyage to as good effect as we your land do purpose to protect. Exeunt. Act Two, Scene Two. On the road to King Lear's palace at Troy Nevant. Enter the King of Cornwall, and his man booted and spurred, a riding wand, and a letter in his hand. But how far distant are we from the court? Some twenty miles, my lord, or thereabouts. It seemeth to me twenty thousand miles, yet hope I to be there within this hour. Then are you like to ride alone for me? To himself. I think my lord is weary of his life. Sweet Goneril, I long to see thy face, which hast so kindly gratified my love. Enter the King of Cambria, booted and spurred, and his man with a wand and a letter. Get a fresh horse. 
for by my soul i swear he looks on the letter i am past patience longer to forbear the wish sight of my beloved mistress dear ragan stay and comfort of my life now what in god's name doth my lord intend to himself he thinks he never shall come at journey's end i would he had old daedalus waxen wings that he might fly so i might stay behind for ere we get to troy no want i see he quite will tire himself his horse and me cornwall and cambria look one upon another and start to see each other there brother of cambria we greet you well as one whom here we little did expect brother of cornwall met in happy time i thought as much to have met with the soldan of persia as to have met you in this place my lord no doubt it is about some great affairs that makes you here so slenderly accompanied to say the truth my lord it is no less and for your part some hasty wind of chance hath blown you hither thus upon the sudden my lord to break off further circumstances for at this time i cannot brook delays tell me your reason i will tell you mine in faith content and therefore to be brief for i am sure my haste as great as yours i am sent for to come unto king lear who by these present letters promiseth his eldest daughter lovely goneril to me in marriage and for present dowry the moiety or half his regiment the lady's love i long ago possessed but until now i never had the father's you tell me wonders yet i will relate strange news and henceforth we must brothers call witness these lines his honourable age being weary of the troubles of his crown his princely daughter ragan will bestow on me in marriage with half his seigneuries whom i would gladly have accepted of with the third part her compliments are such if i have one half and you have the other then between us we must needs have the whole the whole how we knew that Splud! i hope we shall have two holes between us <laughs> why the whole kingdom ay that's very true what then is left for his third daughter's dowry lovely cordella whom the world admires tis very strange i know not what to think unless they mean to make a nun of her twere pity such rare beauty should be hid within the compass of a cloister's wall but howsoe'er if lear's words prove true it will be good my lord for me and you then let us haste all danger to prevent for fear delays do alter his intent exeunt act two scene three a room in king lear's palace enter goneril and ragan sister when did you see cordella last that pretty piece that thinks none good enough to speak to her because sir reverence she hath a little beauty extraordinary since time my father warned her from his presence i never saw her that i can remember god give her joy of her surpassing beauty i think her dowry will be small enough i have incensed my father so against her as he will never be reclaimed again i was not much behind to do the like faith sister what moves you to bear her such good will in truth i think the same that moveth you because she doth surpass us both in beauty beshrew your fingers how right you can guess i tell you true it cuts me to the heart but we will keep her low enough i warrant and clip her wings for mounting up too high whoever hath her shall have a rich marriage of her she were right fit to make a parson's wife for they men say do love fair women well and many times do marry them with nothing with nothing marry god forbid why are there any such i mean no money i cry you mercy i mistook you much and she is far too stately for the church she'll lay her husband's benefice on her back even in one gown if she may have her will in faith poor soul i pity her a little would she were less fair or more fortunate well, I think long until I see my Morgan, the gallant Prince of Cambria, here arrive. And so do I, until the Cornwall King present himself to consummate my joys. Peace, here cometh my father. 
Enter Lear, Perilous, and others. Cease, good my lords, and soon not the reverse of censure, which is now irrevocable. We have dispatched letters of contract unto the kings of Cambria and of Cornwall. Our hand and seal would justify no less. Then do not so dishonour me, my lords, as to make shipwreck of your kingly word. I am as kind as is the pelican that kills itself to save her young one's lives, and yet as jealous as the princely eagle that kills her young ones if they do but dazzle upon the radiant splendour of the sun. Within these two days I expect their coming. Enter kings of Cornwall and Cambria. But in good time they are arrived already. This haste of yours, my lords, doth testify the fervent love you bear unto my daughters, and think yourselves as welcome to King Lear as ever Priam's children were to him. My gracious lord, and father too, I hope, pardon for that I made no greater haste, but were my horse as swift as were my will, I long ere this had seen your majesty. No other excuse of absence can I frame than what my brother hath informed your grace. For our undeserved welcome we do vow perpetually to rest at your command. But you, sweet love, illustrious Goneril, the regent and the sovereign of my soul, is Cornwell welcome to your excellency? As welcome as Leander was to Hero, or brave Aeneas to the Carthage queen, so and more welcome is your grace to me. O oh, may my fortune prove no worse than his, since heavens do know my fancy is as much. Dear Ragan, say if welcome unto thee, all welcomes else will little comfort me. As gold is welcome to the covetous eye, as sleep is welcome to the traveller, as is fresh water to the sea-beaten men, or moistened showers unto the parched ground, or anything more welcomer than this, so and more welcome lovely Morgan is. What resteth then but that we consummate the celebration of these nuptial rites? My kingdom I do equally divide. Princes, draw lots, and take your chance as falls. Then they draw lots. These I resign as freely unto you, as erst by true succession they were mine, and here I do freely dispossess myself, and make you two my true adopted heirs. Myself will sojourn with my son of Cornwall, and take me to my prayers and my beads. I know my daughter, Regan, will be sorry, because I do not spend my days with her. Would I were able to be with both at once? They are the kindest girls in Christendom. I have been silent all this while, my lord, to see if any worthier than myself would once have spoke in poor Cordelia's cause. But love or fear ties silence to their tongues. Oh, hear me speak for her, my gracious lord, whose deeds have not deserved this ruthless doom, as thus to disinherit her of all. Urge this no more, and if thou love thy life. I say she is no daughter that doth scorn to tell her father how she loveth him. Whoever speaketh hereof to me again, I will esteem him for my mortal foe. Come. Let us in, to celebrate with joy the happy nuptials of these lovely pairs. Exeunt omnes, manet perilous. Ah, who so blind as they that will not see the near approach of their own misery? Poor lady, I extremely pity her. And whilst I live, each drop of my heart blood will I strain forth to do her any good. Exit. Act two, scene four. The open country in Britain. Enter the Gallian king and Mumford, disguised like pilgrims. My lord, how do you brook this British air? My lord, I told you of this foolish humour and bound you to the contrary, you know. Pardon me for once, my lord, I did forget. My lord, again, then let's have nothing else and so be ta'en for spies and then tis well. Spoons, I could bite my tongue in two for anger. For God's sake, name yourself some proper name. Call me Tresillus, I'll call thee Denipol. Might I be made the monarch of the world, I could not hit upon these names, I swear. Then call me Will, I'll call thee Jack. 
Well, be it so, for I have well deserved to be called Jack. Stand close, for here a British lady cometh. Enter Cordella. A fairer creature ne'er mine eyes beheld. This is a day of joy unto my sisters, wherein they both are married unto kings, and I, by birth as worthy as themselves, am turned into the world to seek my fortune. How may I blame the fickle queen of chance that maketh me a pattern of her power? Ah, poor weak maid, whose imbecility is far unable to endure these brunts. O oh, father Lear, how dost thou wrong thy child, who always was obedient to thy will? But why accuse I fortune and my father? No, no, it is the pleasure of my God, and I do willingly embrace the rod. It is no goddess, for she doth complain on fortune and the unkindness of her father. These costly robes ill-fitting my estate I will exchange for other meaner habit. Now, if I had a kingdom in my hands, I would exchange it for a milkmaid's smock and petticoat, that she and I might shift our clothes together. I will betake me to my thread and needle, and earn my living with my fingers' ends. O oh, brave, God willing, thou shalt have my custom, by sweet Saint Denis, for here I sadly swear, for all the shirts and nightgear that I wear. I will profess and vow a maiden's life. Then I protest thou shalt not have my custom. I can forbear no longer for to speak, for if I do, I think my heart will break. That's blood, Will. I hope you are not in love with my sempster. I am in such a labyrinth of love as that I know not which way to get out. You'll ne'er get out unless you first get in. I prithee, Jack, cross not my passions. Prithee, Will, to her, and try her patience. Thou fairest creature, whatsoe'er thou art, that ever any mortal eyes beheld, Vouchsafe to me who have o'erheard thy woes to show the cause of these thy sad laments. Ah, pilgrims, what avails to show the cause when there's no means to find a remedy? To utter grief doth ease a heart o'ercharged. To touch a sore doth aggravate the pain. The silly mouse, by virtue of her teeth, released the princely lion from the net. Kind Palmer, which so much desirous to hear the tragic tale of my unhappy youth. Know this in brief. I am the hapless daughter of Lear, sometime king of Brittany. Why, who debars his honourable age from being still the king of Brittany? None, but himself hath dispossessed himself, and given all his kingdom unto the kings of Cornwall and of Cambria with my sisters. Hath he given nothing to your lovely self? He loved me not, and therefore gave me nothing only because I could not flatter him, and in this day of triumph to my sisters doth fortune triumph in my overthrow. Sweet lady, say there should come a king as good as either of your sister's husbands to crave your love, would you accept of him? Oh, do not mock with those in misery, nor do not think, though fortune have the power to spoil mine honour and debase my state, that she hath any interest in my mind, for if the greatest monarch on earth should sue to me in this extremity, except my heart could love, and heart could like, better than any I ever saw, his great estate no more should move my mind than mountains move by the blast of every wind. Think not, sweet nymph, tis holy palmer's guise to grieve at souls fresh torments to devise. Therefore, in witness of my true intent, let heaven and earth bear record of my words. There is a young and lusty Gallian king, so like to me as I am to myself, that earnestly doth crave to have thy love, and join with thee in Hymen's sacred bonds. The like to thee did ne'er these eyes behold. O oh, live to add new torments to my grief! Why didst thou thus entrap me unawares? Ah, oh, Palmer, my estate doth not befit a kingly marriage as the case now stands, while and when as I lived in honour's height, a prince perhaps might postulate my love. Now misery, dishonour, and disgrace have light on me, and quite reversed the case. Thy king will hold thee wise if thou surcease this suit, whereas no dowry will ensue. Then be advised, Palmer, what to do. Cease for thy king, and seek for thyself to woo. Your birth's too high for any but a king. My mind is low enough to love a Palmer rather than any king upon the earth. Oh, but you never can endure their life which is so straight and full of penury. 
Oh, yes, I can, and happy if I might. I'll hold thy palmer's staff within my hand, and think it is the sceptre of a queen. Some time I'll set thy bonnet on my head, and think I wear a rich imperial crown. Some time I'll help thee in thy holy prayers, and think I am with thee in paradise. Thus I'll mock fortune, as she mocketh me, and never will my lovely choice repent. For having thee, I shall have all content. Twas sin to hold her longer in suspense, since that my soul hath vowed she shall be mine. Ah, dear Cordella, cordial to my heart, I am no palmer as I seem to be, but hither come in this unknown disguise to view the admired beauty of those eyes. I am the king of Gallia, gentle maid, although thus slenderly accompanied, and yet thy vassal by imperious love, and sworn to serve thee everlastingly. Whate'er ye be, of high or low descent, all's one to me. I do request but this, that as I am you will accept of me, and I will have you whatsoe'er you be. Yet well I know you come of royal race, I see such sparks of honour in your face. Have Palmer's weeds such power to win, fair ladies? Faith, then I hope the next that falls is mine. Upon condition I no worse might speed, I would for ever wear a Palmer's weed. I like an honest and plain-dealing wench, That swears without exceptions, I will have you. These foppets, that know not whether to love a man or no, Except they first go ask their mother's leave. By this hand I hate them ten times worse than poison. What resteth then our happiness to procure? Faith, go to church to make the matter sure. It shall be so, because the world shall say, King Lear's three daughters were wedded in one day. The celebration of this happy chance, we will defer until we come to France. I like the wooing that's not long a doing. Well, for her sake, I know what I know. I'll never marry whilst I live, except I have one of these British ladies. My humour is alienated from the maids of France. Exeunt. End of Act Two. Act Three of King Lear and His Three Daughters by Anonymous. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Scene 1. A road leading to Cornwall. Enter Perilous Solus. The king hath disposed himself of all. Those to advance, which scarce will give him thanks. His youngest daughter he hath turned away, and no man knows what is become of her. He sojourns now in Cornwall with the eldest, who flattered him, until she did obtain that at his hands which now she doth possess. And now she sees he hath no more to give, it grieves her heart to see her father live. Oh, whom should man trust in this wicked age when children thus against their parents rage? But he, the mirror of mild patience, puts up all wrongs and never gives reply. Yet shames she not in most opprobious sort to call him fool and daughter to his face? And sets her parasites of purpose oft in scoffing wise to offer him disgrace. O oh, iron age! O oh, times! O oh, monstrous wild! When parents are contempted of the child! His pension she hath half restrained from him, And will, ere long, the other half I fear, For she thinks nothing is bestowed in vain, but that which doth her father's life maintain. Trust not alliance, but trust strangers rather, since daughters prove disloyal to the father. Well, I will counsel him the best I can. Would I were able to redress his wrong. Yet what I can, unto my utmost power, he shall be sure of to the latest hour. Exit. Act Three, Scene Two. A room in the royal palace of Cornwall. Enter Goneril and Scaliger. I prithee, Scaliger, tell me what thou thinkest. Could any woman of our dignity endure such quips and peremptory taunts as I do daily from my doting father? Doth not suffice that I him keep of alms, who is not able for to keep himself? But as if he were our better, he should think to check and snap me up at every word. 
I cannot make me a new-fashioned gown, and set it forth with more than common cost, but his old, doting, doltish, withered wit is sure to give a senseless check for it. I cannot make a banquet extraordinary to grace myself and spread my name abroad, but he, old fool, is captious by and by, and saith, the cost would well suffice for twice. Judge then, I pray, what reason is't that I should stand alone charged with his vain expense, and that my sister Regan should go free, to whom he gave as much as unto me. I prithee, Scaliger, tell me if thou know by any means to rid me of this woe. Your many favours still bestowed on me, bind me in duty to advise your grace how you may soonest remedy this ill. The large allowance which he hath from you is what makes him so forget himself. Therefore a bridge it hath, and you shall see that, having less, he will more thankful be. For why, abundance makes us forget the fountains whence the benefits do spring. Well, Scaliger, for thy kind advice herein, I will not be ungrateful if I live. I have restrained half his portion already, and I will presently restrain the other, that having no means to relieve himself, he may go seek elsewhere for better help. Exit. Go, viperous women, shame to all thy sex. The heavens no doubt will punish thee for this. And me, a villain, that do curry favour, have given the daughter counsel against the father. But us the world doth this experience give, that he that cannot flatter cannot live. Exit. Act three. Scene three. A hall in the royal palace of Cornwall. Enter King of Cornwall, Lear, Perilous, and Nobles. Father, what aileth you to be so sad? Methinks you frolic not as you were wont. The nearer we do grow unto our graves, the less we do delight in worldly joys. But if a man can frame himself to mirth, it is a mean for to prolong his life. Then welcome sorrow, Lear's only friend, Who doth desire his troubled days had end. Comfort yourself, father, here comes your daughter, Who much will grieve, I know, to see you sad. Enter Goneril. But more doth grieve, I fear, to see me live. My Goneril, you come in wished time, To put your father from these pensive dumps. In faith, I fear that all things go not well. What, do you fear that I have angered him? Hath he complained of me unto my lord? I'll provide him with a piece of bread and cheese, for in time he'll practice nothing else. Then carry tales from one unto the other. Tis all his practice for to kindle strife, twixt you, my lord, and me, your loving wife. But I will take an order, if I can, to cease the effect where first the cause began. Sweet, be not angry in a partial cause. He ne'er complained of thee in all his life. Father, you must not weigh a woman's words. Alas, not I. Poor soul, she breeds young bones, and that is it makes her so touchy sure. What, breeds young bones already? You will make an honest woman of me then belike. O oh, vile old wretch, who ever heard the like that seeketh thus his own child to defame? I cannot stay to hear this discord sound. Exit. For any one that loves your company, you may go pack and seek some other place to sow the seed of discord and disgrace. Exit. Thus say you do the best that e'er I can. Tis rested straight into another sense. This punishment my heavy sins deserve, and more than this ten thousand thousand times. Else aged Lear them could never find cruel to him, to whom he hath been kind. Why do I overlive myself to see the course of nature quite reversed in me? Ah, oh, gentle death, if ever any white did wish thy reverence with a perfect zeal, then come, I pray thee, even with all my heart, and in my sorrows with thy fatal dart. <laughs> he weeps. 
ah do not so disconsolate yourself nor do your aged cheeks with wasting tears what thou art thou that takest any pity upon the worthless state of old lear one who doth bear as great a share of grief as if it were my dearest father's case ah oh, good my friend how ill art thou advised for to consort with miserable men go learn to flatter where thou mayst in time get favour amongst the mighty and so climb for now i am so poor and full of want as that i ne'er can recompense thy love what's got by flattery doth not long endure and men in favour live not most secure my conscience tells me if i should forsake you i were the hatefullest excrement on the earth which well do know in course of former time how good my lord hath been to me and mine did i e'er raise thee higher than the rest of all thy ancestors which were before i ne'er did seek it but by your good grace i still enjoyed my own with quietness did i e'er give thee living to increase the due revenues which thy father left i had enough my lord and having that what should you need to give me any more oh did i ever dispossess myself and give thee half my kingdom in good will alas my lord there were no reason why you should have such a thought to give it me nay if thou talk of reason then be mute for with good reason i can thee confute if they which first by nature's sacred law do owe to me the tribute of their lives if they to whom i always have been kind and bountiful beyond comparison if they for whom i have undone myself and brought my age unto this extreme want do now reject contemn despise abhor me what reason moveth thee to sorrow for me where reason fails let tears confirm my love and speak how much your passions do me move o oh, good my lord condemn not all for one you have two daughters left to whom i know you shall be welcome if you please to go oh how thy words add sorrow to my soul to think of my unkindness to cordella whom causeless i did dispossess of all upon the unkind suggestions of her sisters and for her sake i think this heavy doom is fallen on me and not without desert yet unto regan was i always kind and gave to her the half of all i had it may be if i should to her repair she would be kinder and entreat me fair no doubt she would and practice ere to be long by force of arms for to redress your wrong well since thou dost advise before to go i am resolved to try the worst of woe exeunt act three scene four a room in the royal palace of cambria enter regan solar how may i bless the hour of my nativity which bodeth unto me such happy stars how may i thank kind fortune that vouchsafes to all my actions such desired events i rule the king of cambria as i please the states are all obedient to my will and look whate'er i say it shall be so not any one that dareth answer no my elder sister lives in royal state and wanteth nothing fitting her degree yet hath she such a cooling card withal as that her honey savoureth much of gall my father with her is quartermaster still and many times restrains her of her will but if he were with me and served me so i'd send him packing somewhere else to go i'd entertain him with such slender cost that he should quickly wish to change his host exit act three scene five a room in the royal palace of cornwall enter cornwall goneril and attendants ah goneril what dire unhappy chance hath sequestered thy father from our presence that no report can yet be heard of him some great unkindness hath been offered him exceeding far the bounds of patience else all the world shall never be persuade 
he would forsake us without notice made. Alas, my lord, whom doth it touch so near? Or who hath interest in this grief but I, whom sorrow had brought to her longest home? But that I know his qualities so well, I know he is but stolen upon my sister at unawares, to see her how she fares, and spend a little time with her, to note how all things go, and how she likes her choice. And, when occasion serves, he'll steal from her, and unawares return to us again. Therefore, my lord, be frolic, and resolve to see my father here again ere long. I hoped so too, but yet to be more sure, I'll send a post immediately to know whether he be arrived there or no. Exit. But I will intercept the messenger, and temper him before he doth depart, with sweet persuasions and with sound rewards, that his report shall ratify my speech, and make my lord cease further to inquire. If he be not gone to my sister's court, as sure my mind presageth that he is, he haply may, by travelling unknown ways, fall sick, and as a common passenger be dead and buried. Would God it were so well, for then there were no more to do but this. He went away, and none knows where he is. But say he be in Cambria with the king, and there exclaim against me as he will. I know he is as welcome to my sister as water is into a broken ship. Well, after him I'll send such thunderclaps of slander, scandal, and invented tales that all the blame shall be removed from me and unperceived rebound upon himself. Thus with one nail another I'll expel, and make the world judge that I used him well. Enter the messenger that should go to Cambria with a letter in his hand. My honest friend, whither away so fast? To Cambria, madam, with letters from the king. To whom? Unto your father, if he be there. Let me see them. She opens them. Madam, I hope your grace will stand between me and my neck verse, if I be called in question for opening the king's letters. <laughs> Twas I that opened them, it was not thou. Ay, but you need not care, and so must I, a handsome man, be quickly trussed up, and when a man's hanged, all the world cannot save him. He that hangs thee were better hang his father, or that but hurts thee in the least degree. I tell thee, we make great account of thee. I am o'erjoyed. I surfeit of sweet words. <laughs> kind queen, had I a hundred lives, I would spend ninety-nine of them for you for that word. <laughs> Ay, but thou wouldst keep one life still, and that's as many as thou wert like to have. That one life is not too dear for my good queen. This sword, this buckler, this head, this heart, these hands, arms, legs, tripes, bowels, and all the members else whatsoever are at your dispose. Use me, trust me, command me. If I fail in anything, tie me to a dung-cart, and make a scavenger's horse of me, and whip me, so long as I have any skin on my back. In token of further employment, take that. Flings him a purse. A strong bond, a firm obligation. Good in law, good in law. If I keep not the condition, let my neck be the forfeiture of my negligence. I like thee well. Thou hast a good tongue. Oh, and as bad a tongue, if it be set on it, as any oyster-wife at Billingsgate hath. Oh, why, I have made many of my neighbours forsake their houses with railing upon them and go dwell elsewhere and so by my means houses have been good cheap in our parish my tongue being well wetted with colour is more sharp than a razor of palermo oh thou art a fit man for my purpose 
commend me not sweet queen before you try me as my deserts are so do think of me well said then this is thy trial instead of carrying the king's letters to my father carry thou these letters to my sister which contain matter quite contrary to the other there shall she be given to understand that my father hath detracted her given out slanderous speeches against her and that he hath most intolerably abused me said my lord and me at variance and made mutinies amongst the commons these things although it be not so yet thou must affirm them to be true with oaths and protestations as will serve to drive my sister out of love with him and cause my will accomplished to be this do thou winst my favour for ever and makest a high way of preferment to thee and all thy friends it sufficeth conceit it is already done i will so tongue whip him that i will leave him as bare of credit as a poulter leaves a coney when she pulls off his skin yet there is a further matter i thirst to hear it if my sister thinketh convenient as my letters importeth to make him away hast thou the heart to effect it few words are best in so small a matter these are but trifles by this book i will kisses the paper about it presently i long till it be done i fly i fly exeunt end of act three Act Four of King Lear and His Three Daughters by Anonymous. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Scene One Outside a Church in Gallia. Enter Cordella Sola. I have been over negligent to day in going to the temple of my God to render thanks for all his benefits, which he miraculously hath bestowed upon me in raising me out of my mean estate, whenas I was devoid of worldly friends, and placing me in such sweet content as far exceeds the reach of my deserts. My kingly husband, mirror of his time, for zeal, for justice, kindness, and for care, to God his subjects, me, and common weal by his appointment, was ordained for me. I cannot wish the thing that I do want. I cannot want the thing, but I may have, save only this, which I shall ne'er obtain, my father's love, oh, this I ne'er shall gain. I would abstain from any nutriment, and pine my body to the very bones, barefoot i would on pilgrimage set forth unto the furthest quarters of the earth and all my lifetime would i sackcloth wear and mourning-wise pour dust upon my head so he but to forgive me once would please that his grey hairs might go to heaven in peace and yet i know not how i him offended or wherein justly i have deserved blame o oh, sisters you are much to blame in this it was not he but you that did me wrong. Yet God forgive both him and you and me, even as I do in perfect charity. I will to church, and pray unto my Saviour, that ere I die, I may obtain his favour. Exit. Act Four, Scene Two, A Road Leading to the Royal Palace of Cambria. Enter Lear and Perilous Faintly rest on me my lord and stay yourself the way seems tedious to your aged limbs nay rest on me kind friend and stay thyself thou art as old as i but more kind ah good my lord it ill befits that i should lean upon the person of a king but it fits worse that i should bring thee forth that had no cause to come along with me through these uncouth paths and tireful ways, and never ease thy fainting limbs of wit. Thou hast left all, I all, to come with me, and I for all 
have naught to guerdon thee. Cease, good my lord, to aggravate my woes with these kind words, which cuts my heart in two, to think your will should want the power to do. Cease, good perilous, for to call me lord, and think me but the shadow of myself. That honourable title will I give unto my lord, so long as I do live. O oh, be of comfort, for I see the place whereas your daughter keeps her residence. And lo, in happy time the Cambrian prince is here arrived to gratify our coming. Enter the prince of Cambria, Regan, and nobles. Look upon them and whisper together. Were I best speak, or sit me down and die? I am ashamed to tell this heavy tale. Then let me tell it, if you please, my lord. Tis shame for them that were the cause thereof. What two old men are those that seem so sad? Methinks I should remember well their looks. No, I mistake not. Sure it is my father. I must dissemble kindness now of force. She runneth to him and kneels down, saying, Father, I bid you welcome, full of grief, to see your grace used thus unworthily, and ill befit it of your reverend age, to come on foot a journey so endurable. Oh, what disaster hath been the cause to make your cheeks so hollow, spare, and lean? He cannot speak for weeping. For God's love, come, let us refresh him with some needed things, and at much leisure we may better know whence springs the ground from this unlooked for woe. Come, father, ere we any further talk, you shall refresh you after this weary walk. Exeunt. Manet Regan. Comes he to me with finger in his eye to tell the tale of my sister here, whom I do know he greatly hath abused, and now, like a contentious crafty wench, he first begins for to complain himself, when as himself is in the greatest fault. I'll not be partial in my sister's cause, nor yet believe his doting vain reports, who for a trifle, safely, I dare say, upon a spleen is stolen thence away, and here, forsooth, he hopeth to have harbour, and to be moaned and maked on like a child. But ere be long, his coming he shall curse, and truly say he came from bad to worse. Yet will I make fair weather to procure convenient means, and then I'll strike it sure. Exit. Act 4, Scene 3, Outside the Royal Palace of Cambria. Enter Messenger Solus. Now, happily, I am arrived here, before the stately palace of the Cambrian king. If Lear be here safe seated, and in rest, to rouse him from it, I will do my best. Enter Regan. Now, bags of gold, your virtue is no doubt to make me in my message bold and stout the king of heaven preserve your majesty and send your highness everlasting reign thanks good friend but what imports thy message kind greetings from the cornwall queen the residue these letters will declare she opens the letters how fares our royal sister i did leave her at my parting in good health she reads the letters, frowns, and stamps. <laughs> See how her colour comes and goes again. Now red as scarlet, now as pale as ash. <laughs> oh, See how she knits her brow, and bites her lips, and stamps, and makes a dumb show of disdain, mixed with revenge and violent extremes. Here will be more work and more crowns for me. Alas, poor soul, hath he used her thus, and is now come hither with intent to set divorce betwixt my lord and me. Death he gives out, that death here report, that I do rule my husband as I list, and therefore means to alter so the case, that I shall know my lord's to be my head. Well, it were best for him to take good heeds, or I will make him hop without a head's for his presumption, dotard that he is. In Cornwall he hath made his mutinies, first setting of the king against the queen, then stirring up the commons against the king, 
that he hath been continued any longer, he had been called in question of his fact, so upon that occasion thence he fled, and comes thus slyly stealing unto us. And now, already, since his coming hither, my lord and he are grown in such a league, that I can have no conference with his grace. I fear he doth already intimate some forged cavillations against my states. Tis therefore best to cut him off in time, lest slanderous rumours once abroad dispersed. It is too late for them to be reversed. Friends, as the tenor of these letters shows, my sister puts great confidence in thee. She never yet committed trust to me, but as I hope she found me always faithful. So will I be to any friend of hers that hath occasion to employ my help. Has thou the heart to give a stratagem, and give a stab or two if need require? I have a heart compact of adamant, which never knew what melting pity meant. I weigh no more the murdering of a man than I respect the cracking of a flea when i do catch her biting on my skin if you will have your husband or your father or both of them sent to another world do but command me do it it shall be done it is enough we make no doubt of thee meet us to-morrow here at nine o'clock meanwhile farewell and drink that for my sake ay this is it will make me do the deed <sighs> Oh, had I every day such customers, this were the gainfullest trade in Christendom, a purse of gold given for a paltry stab. Why, here's a wench that longs to have a stab. <laughs> well, I could give it her, <clears throat> and ne'er hurt her neither. <sighs> Exit. Act four, scene four. A room in the royal palace of Gallia. Enter the Gallian king and Cordella. When will these clouds of sorrow once disperse, And smiling joy triumph upon thy brow? When will this scene of sadness have an end, And pleasant acts ensue to move delight? When will my lovely queen cease to lament, And take some comfort to her grieved thoughts? If of thyself thou deign'st to have no care, Yet pity me, whom thy grief makes despair. O oh, grieve not you, my lord, you have no cause. Let not my passions move your mind a whit, For I am bound by nature to lament For his ill will that life to me first lent. If so the stalk be dried with disdain, Withered and sear the branch must needs remain. But thou art now graft in another stock, i am the stock and thou the lovely branch and from my root continual sap shall flow to make thee flourish with perpetual spring forget thy father and thy kindred now since they forsake thee like inhuman beasts think they are dead since all their kindness dies and bury them where black oblivion lies think not thou art the daughter of old lear who did unkindly disinherit thee but think thou art the noble gallian queen and wife to him that dearly loveth thee embrace the joys that present with thee dwell let sorrow pack and hide herself in hell not that i miss my country or my kin my old acquaintance or my ancient friends doth any wit distemperate my mind knowing you which are more dear to me than country kin and all things else can be yet pardon me my gracious lord in this for what can stop the course of nature's power as easy is it for four-footed beasts to stay themselves upon the liquid air and mount aloft into the element and overstrip the feathered fowls in flight as easy is it for the slimy fish to live and thrive without the help of water as easy is it for blackamoor to wash away the tawny colour from his skin which all oppose against the course of nature as i am able to forget my father mirror of virtue phoenix of our age too kind a daughter for an unkind father be of good comfort for i will dispatch ambassadors immediately for britain 
unto the king of cornwall's court whereas your father keepeth now his residence and in the kindest manner him entreat that setting former grievances apart he will be pleased to come and visit us if no entreaty will suffice the turn i'll offer him the half of all my crown if that moves not we'll furnish out a fleet and sail to cornwall for to visit him and there you shall be firmly reconciled in perfect love as erst you were before where tongue cannot sufficient thanks afford the king of heaven remunerate my lord only be blithe and frolic sweet with me this and much more i'll do to comfort thee exeunt act four scene five a room in the royal palace of cambria enter messenger solus oh, it is a world to see now i am flush how many friends i purchase everywhere <laughs> how many seek to creep into my favour and kiss their hands and bend their knees to me <sighs> no more here comes the queen now shall i know her mind and hope for to derive more crowns from her <laughs> enter Reagan my friend i see thou mindest thy promise well and art before me here methinks to-day i am a poor man and it like your grace but yet i always love to keep my word well keep thy word with me and thou shalt see that of a poor man i will make thee rich i long to hear it it might have been dispatched if you had told me of it yesternight it is a thing of right strange consequence and well i cannot utter it in words <laughs> it is more strange that i am not by this beside myself with longing for to hear it were it to meet the devil in his den and try a bout with him for a scratched face i'd undertake it if you would but bid me ah good my friend that i should have thee do is such a thing as i do shame to speak yet it must needs be done i'll speak it for thee queen shall i kill thy father <laughs> i notice that and if it be so say ay oh <laughs> why that's enough and yet that is not all what else thou must kill that old man that came with him here are two hands for each of them is one and for each hand here is a recompense gives him two purses oh that i had ten hands by miracle i could tear ten in pieces with my teeth so in my mouth you'd put a purse of gold <laughs> but in what manner must it be effected to-morrow morning ere the break of day i by the while will send them to the thickets that is about two miles from the court and promise them to meet them there myself because i must have private conference about some news i have received from cornwall this is enough i know they will not fail and then be ready for to play thy parts which done thou mayest right easily escape and no man once mistrusts thee for the fact but yet before thou prosecute the act show him the letter which my sister sent there let him read his own indictment first and then proceed to execution but see thou faint not for they will speak fair could he speak words as pleasing as the pipe of mercury which charmed the hundred eyes of watchful argus and enforced him sleep yet hear a word so pleasing to my thoughts to the purse as quite shall take away the sound of his exit about it then and when thou hast dispatched i'll find a means to send thee after him exit act four scene six a room in the royal palace of cornwall enter cornwall and goneril I wonder that the messenger doth stay, whom we dispatched for Cambria so long since. If that his answer do not please us well, and he do shew good reason for delay, I'll teach him how to dally with his king, 
and to detain us in such long suspense. My lord, I think the reason may be this. My father means to come along with him, and therefore tis his pleasure he shall stay, for to attend upon him on the way. It may be so, and therefore, till I know the truth thereof, I will suspend my judgment. Enter servant. And to like your grace, there is an ambassador arrived from Gallia, and craves admittance to your majesty. From Gallia? What should his message hither import? Is not your father haply gone thither? Well, whatsoe'er it be, bid him come in. He shall have audience. Enter ambassador. What news from Gallia? Speak, ambassador. The noble king and queen of Gallia first salutes by me their honourable father, my lord Lear. Next they commend them kindly to your graces, as those whose welfare they entirely wish. Letters I have to deliver to my lord Lear, and presents too, if I might speak with him. If you might speak with him? Why, do you think we are afraid that you should speak with him? Pardon me, madam, for I think not so but say so only cause he is not here. Indeed, my friend, upon some urgent cause, he is at this time absent from the court, but if a day or two you here repose, tis very likely you shall have him here. Are we not worthy to receive your message? I had in charge to do it to himself. To herself. It may be, then, twill not be done in haste. How doth my sister brook the air of France? Exceeding well and never sick one hour since first she set her foot upon the shore. I am the more sorry. I hope not so, madam. Oh, didst thou not say that she was ever sick since the first hour that she arrived there? No, madam, I said quite contrary. <laughs> then I mistook thee. Then she is merry if she have her health? Oh, no, her grief exceeds, until the time that she be reconciled unto her father. God continue it. What, madam? <laughs> Why, her health. Amen to that. But God release her grief, and send her father in a better mind, than to continue always so unkind. Oh, be a mediator in her cause, and seek all means to expiate his wrath. Madam, I hope your grace will do the like. Should I mean to exasperate his wrath against my sister, whom I love so dear, no, no. To expiate or mitigate his wrath, for he hath misconceived without a cause. Oh, ay, what else? "'Tis pity it should be so. Would it were otherwise?" "'It were a great pity it should be otherwise." "'Then how, madam?" "'Then that they should be reconciled again." "'It shows you bear an honourable mind." "'It shows thy understanding to be blind, and that thou hast need of an interpreter." "'Speaks to herself.' "'Well, I will know thy message ere it be long, and find a mean to cross it if I can." "'Come in, my friend, and frolic in our court till certain notice of my father come. Exeunt. Act four, scene seven. In the open country of Cambria. Enter Lear and Perilous. My lord, you are up to-day before your hour. Tis news to you to be abroad so wraith. Tis news indeed. I am so extreme heavy that I can scarcely keep my eyelids open. And so am I but I impute the cause to rising sooner than we used to do. Hither my daughter means to come disguised. I'll sit me down and read until she come. Pulls out a book and sits down. She'll not be long, I warrant you, my lord. But say a couple of these they call good fellows should step out of a hedge and set upon us. We were in good case for to answer them. Twere not for us to stand upon our hands. I fear we scant should stand upon our legs. But how should we do to defend ourselves? Even pray to God to bless us from their hands, for fervent prayer much ill hap withstands. I'll sit and pray with you for company. Yet was I ne'er so heavy in my life. They both fall asleep. Enter the messenger, or murderer, with two daggers in his hands. <laughs> were it not a mad jest if two or three of my profession should meet me and lay me down in a ditch and play rob thief with me and perforce take my gold away from me whilst i act this stratagem and by this means the greybeards should escape faith when i were at liberty again i would make no more to do but go to the next tree and there 
hang myself sees them and starts oh, but stay methinks my youths are here already and with pure zeal have prayed themselves asleep i think they know to what intent they came and are provided for another world he takes their books away now could i stab them bravely while they sleep and in a manner put them to no pain and doing so i showed the mighty friendship for fear of death is worse than death itself but that my sweet queen willed me for to show this letter to them ere i did the deed mass they begin to stir i'll stand aside so shall i come upon them unawares they wake and rise i marvel that my daughter stays so long i fear we did mistake the place my lord god grant we do not miscarry in this place i had a short nap but so full of dread as much amazeth me to think thereof fear not my lord dreams are but fantasies and slight imaginations of the brain persuade him so but i'll make him and you confess that dreams do often prove too true i pray my lord what was the effect of it i may go near to guess what it pretends <laughs> leave that to me i will expound the dream Methought my daughters goneril and regan stood both before me with such grim aspects each brandishing a falchion in their hand ready to lop a limb off where it fell and in their other hand a naked poignard wherewith they stabbed me in a hundred places and to their thinking left me there for dead but then my youngest daughter fair cordella came with a box of balsam in her hand and poured it into my bleeding wounds by whose good means i was recovered well in perfect health as erst i was before and with the fear of this i did awake and yet for fear my feeble joints do quake i'll make you quake for something presently stand stand they reel we do my friend although with much ado deliver oh, deliver deliver us good lord from such as he you should have prayed before while it was time and then perhaps you might have scaped my hands but you like faithful watchmen fell asleep the whilst i came and took your halberds from you shows their books <laughs> and now you want your weapons of defence how have you any hope to be delivered this comes because you have no better stay but fall asleep when you should watch and pray my friend thou seemst to be a proper man blood how the old slave claws me by the elbow he thinks belike to scape by scraping thus and it may be are in some need of money oh that to be false behold my evidence shows his purses if that i have will do thee any good i give it thee even with a right good will the messenger takes it here take mine too and wish with all my heart to do thee pleasure it were twice as much the messenger takes his and weighs them both in his hands hmm. oh none of them they are too light for me puts them in his pocket why then farewell and if thou have occasion in anything to use me to the queen tis like enough that i can pleasure thee they proffer to go do you hear do you hear sir if i had occasion to use you to the queen would you do one thing for me i should ask 
ay anything that lies within my power here is my hand upon it so farewell proffers to go hear you sir hear you pray a word with you methinks a comely honest ancient man should not dissemble with one for advantage i know when i shall come to try this gear you will recant from all that you have said mistrust not him but try him when thou wilt he is her father therefore may do much i know he is and therefore mean to try him you are his friend too i must try you both prithee do prithee do proffer to go out stay greybeards then and prove men of your words the queen hath tied me by a solemn oath here in this place to see you both dispatched now for the safeguard of my conscience do me the pleasure for to kill yourselves so shall you save me labour for to do it and prove yourselves true old men of your words and here i vow in sight of all the world i ne'er will trouble you whilst i live again afraid is not with terror good my friend nor strike such fear into our aged hearts play not the cat which dallieth with the mouse and on a sudden maketh her a prey but if thou art marked for the man of death to me and my daemon tell me plain that we may be prepared for the stroke and make ourselves fit for the world to come i am the last of any mortal race that e'er your eyes are likely to behold and hither sent of purpose to this place to give a final period to your days which are so wicked and have lived so long that your own children seek to short your life camest thou from france of purpose to do this <gasps> from france what oh, soons do i look like a frenchman sure i have not mine own face on somebody hath changed faces with me and i know not of it but i am sure my apparel is all english sirrah what meanest thou to ask that question i could spoil the fashion of this face for anger <laughs> a french face because my daughter whom i have offended and at whose hands i have deserved as ill as any father did of child is queen of france no thanks at all to me but unto god who may in justice see if it be so that she doth seek revenge as with good reason she may justly do i will most willingly resign my life for sacrifice to mitigate her ire i never will entreat thee to forgive because i am unworthy for to live therefore speak soon and i will soon make speed whether cordella will thee do this deed as i am a perfect gentleman thou speakest french to me i never heard cordella's name before nor never was in france in all my life i never knew thou hadst a daughter there to whom thou didst prove so unkind a churl but thy own tongue declares that thou hast been a vile old wretch and full of heinous sin ah no my friend thou art deceived much to her except for my confess i wronged through doting frenzy and o'er jealous love there lives not any under heaven's bright eye that can convict me of impiety and therefore sure thou dost mistake the mark for i am in true peace with all the world you are the fitter for the king of heaven and therefore for to rid thee of suspense know thou the queens of cambria and cornwall thy own two daughters goneril and regan appointed me to massacre thee here why wouldst thou then persuade me that thou art in charity with all the world but now when thy own issue hold thee in such hate 
that they have hired me to abridge thy fate oh fie upon such vile dissembling breath that would deceive even at the point of death am i awake or is it but a dream fear nothing man thou art but in a dream and thou shalt never wake until doomsday by then i hope thou wilt have slept enough yet gentle friend grant one thing ere i die hmm. i'll grant you anything except your lives oh but assure me by some certain token that my two daughters hide thee to this deed if i were once resolved of that then i would wish no longer life but crave to die that to be true in sight of heaven i swear swear not by heaven for fear of punishment the heavens are guiltless of such heinous acts i swear by earth the mother of us all swear not by earth for she abhors to bear such bastards as are murderers of her sons oh, why then by hell and all the devils i swear swear not by hell for that stands gaping wide to swallow thee and if thou do this deed thunder and lightning Whew, i would that word were in his belly again it has frighted me even to the very heart this old man is some strong magician his words have turned my mind from this exploit then neither heaven earth nor hell be witness but let this paper witness for them all shows goneril's letter shall i relent or shall i prosecute shall i resolve or where i best recant i will not crack my credit with two queens to whom i have already passed my word oh but my conscience for this act doth tell i get heaven's hate earth's scorn and pains of hell <sighs> they bless themselves o oh, just jehovah whose almighty power doth govern all things in this spacious world how canst thou suffer such outrageous acts to be committed without just revenge o oh, viperous generation and a curse to seek his blood whose blood did make them first ah oh, my true friend in all extremity let us submit us to the will of god things past all sense let us not seek to know it is god's will and therefore must be so my friend i am prepared for the stroke strike when thou wilt and i forgive thee here even from the very bottom of my heart but i am not prepared for to strike farewell perilous even the truest friend that ever lived in adversity the latest kindness i'll request of thee is that thou go unto my daughter cordella and carry her her father's latest blessing withal desire her that she will forgive me for i have wronged her without any cause now lord receive me for i come to thee and die, I hope, in perfect charity. Dispatch, I pray thee, I have lived too long. Ay, but you are unwise to send an errand by him that never meaneth to deliver it. Why, he must go along with you to heaven. It were not good you should go all alone. No doubt he shall, when by the course of nature he must surrender up his due to death. But that time shall not come till god permit nay presently to bear you company i have a passport for him in my pocket already sealed and he must needs ride post shows a bag of money the letter which i read imports not so it only toucheth me no word of him ay but the queen commands it must be so and i am paid for him as well as you i who have borne you company in life most willingly will bear a share in death 
It skilleth not for me, my friend, a wit, nor for a hundred such as thou and I. <sighs> Marry, but it doth, sir, by your leave. Your good days are past. Though it be no matter for you, it is a matter for me. Proper men are not so rife. Oh, but beware how thou dost lay thy hand upon the high anointed of the Lord. Oh, be advised ere thou dost begin. Dispatch me straight, but meddle not with him. Friend, thy commission is to deal with me, and I am he that hath deserved all. The plot was laid to take away my life, and here it is. I do entreat thee, take it, yet for my sake. And as thou art a man, spare this my friend that either with me came. I brought him forth, whereas he had not been, but for good will to bear me company. He left his friends, his country, and his goods, and came with me in most extremity. Oh, if he should miscarry here and die, who is the cause of it? But only I. Why, that am I. Let that ne'er trouble thee. Oh, no, tis I. Oh, had I now to give thee the monarchy of all the spacious world, to save his life, I would bestow it on thee. But I have nothing but these tears and prayers, and the submission of a bended knee. Nails. Oh, if all this to mercy move thy mind, spare him. In heaven thou shalt like mercy find. I am as hard to be moved as another, and yet methinks the strength of their persuasions stirs me a little. My friend, if fear of the almighty power hath power to move thee, we have said enough. But if thy mind be movable with gold, we have not presently to give it thee. Yet to thyself thou mayest do greater good to keep thy hands still undefiled from blood, for do but well consider with thyself when thou hast finished this outrageous act, what horror still will haunt thee for the deed? Think this again, that they which would incense thee for to be the butcher of their father when it is done, for fear it should be known, would make a means to rid thee from the world. O oh, then art thou for ever tied in chains, of everlasting torments to endure, even in the hottest hole of grisly hell, such pains as never mortal tongue can tell. It thunders. He quakes, and lets fall the dagger next to Perilous. Oh, heavens be thanked, he will spare my friend. Now, when thou wilt, come, make an end of me. He lets fall the other dagger. Oh, happy fight, he means to save my lord. The king of heaven continue this good mind. Why stayest thou to do execution? <sighs> I am as willful as you for your life. I will not do it. Now you do entreat me. Ah, now I see thou hast some spark of grace. Beshrew you for it. You have put it in me. The parlousest old man that e'er I heard. Well, to be flat, I'll not meddle with you. Here I found you, and here I'll leave you. If any ask you why the case so stands, Oh, say that your tongues were better than your hands. Oh. Exit Messenger. Farewell. If ever we together meet, it shall go hard. But I will thee regret. Courage, my lord, the worst is overpast. Let us give thanks to God, and hie us hence. Thou art deceived, for I am past the best, and know not whither for to go from hence. Death had better welcome unto me than longer life to add more misery. It were not good to return from whence we came unto your daughter Ragan back again. Now let us go to France unto Cordilla, your youngest daughter. Doubtless she will succour you. Oh, how can I persuade myself of that, since the other two were quite devoid of love, to whom I was so kind, as that my gifts might make them love me, if twere nothing else? No worldly gifts, but grace from God on high doth nourish virtue and true charity. Remember well what words Cordelia spake what time you asked her, how she loved your grace. She said her love unto you was as much as ought a child to bear unto her father. 
but she did find my love was not to her as should a father bear unto a child that makes not her love to be any less if she do love you as a child should do you have tried too try one more for my sake i'll ne'er entreat you further trial make remember well the dream you had of late and think what comfort it foretells to us come truest friend that ever man possessed i know thou counsellest all things for the best if this third daughter play a kinder part it comes of god and not of my desert exeunt act four scene eight outside the royal palace of cornwall enter the gallian ambassador solus there is of late news come unto the court that old lord lear remains in cambria i'll hie me thither presently to impart my letters and my message unto him i never was less welcome to a place in all my lifetime than i have been hither especially unto the stately queen who would not cast one gracious look on me but still with lowering and suspicious eyes would take exceptions at each word i spake and fain she would have undermined me to know what my ambassage did import but she is like to hop without her hope and in this matter for to want her will though by report she'll have it in all things else well i will post away for cambria within these few days i hope to be there exit end of act four Act Five of King Lear and His Three Daughters by Anonymous. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Scene One A Room in the Royal Palace of Gallia. Enter the King and Queen of Gallia and Mumford. By this our father understands our mind, and our kind greetings sent to him of late. Therefore my mind presageth, ere it be long, we shall receive from Britain happy news. I fear my sister will dissuade his mind, for she to me hath always been unkind. Fear not, my love, since that we know the worst, the last means helps, if that we miss the first. If he'll not come to Gallia unto us, then we will sail to Britain unto him. Well, if I once see Britain again, I have sworn I'll ne'er come home without my wench. And I'll not be forsworn. I'll rather never come home while I live. Are you sure, Mumford, she is a maid still? Nay, I'll not swear she is a maid, but she goes for one. I'll take her at all adventures, if I can get her. Ay, that's well put in. Well put in? Nay, it was ill put in. For, had it been as well put in as e'er I put in, in my days, I would have made her follow me to France. Nay, you'd have been so kind as take her with you, or else, were I as she, I would have been so loving as I'd stay behind you. Yet I must confess, you are a very proper man, and able to make a wench do more than she would do. Well, I have a pair of slops for the nonce. We'll hold all your mocks. Nay, we see you have a handsome hose. Ay, and of the newest fashion. More bobs, more. Put them in still. They'll serve instead of bombast. Yet put not in too many, lest the seams crack, and they fly out amongst you again. You must not think to outface me so easily in my mistress's quarrel, who, if I see once again ten team of horses, shall not draw me away till I have full and whole possession. Ay, but one team and a cart will serve the turn. Not only for him, but also for his wench. Well, you are two to one, I'll give you over, and since I see you so pleasantly disposed, which indeed is but seldom seen, I'll claim a promise of you, which you shall not deny me. For promise is debt, and by this hand you promised it to me. Therefore you owe it me, and you shall pay it me, or I'll see you upon an action of unkindness. Pray thee, Lord Mumford, what promise did I make thee? Faith, nothing but this, that the next fair weather, which is very now, you would go in progress down to the seaside, which is very near. Faith, in this motion I will join with thee, and be a mediator to my queen. Prithee, my love, let this match go forward. My mind foretells twill be a lucky voyage entreaty needs not where you may command so you be pleased i am right well content yet as the sea i much desire to see so am i most unwilling to be seen we'll go disguised all unknown to any 
Howsoe'er you make one, I'll make another. And I the third. Oh, I am overjoyed. See what love is which getteth with a word, what all the world besides could ne'er obtain. But what disguises shall we have, my lord? Faith thus, my queen and I will be disguised like a plain country couple, and you shall be Roger, our man, and wait upon us. Or if you will, you shall go first, and we will wait on you. Twere more than time, this device is excellent. Come, let us about it. Exeunt. Act Five, Scene Two. A room in the royal palace of Cambria. Enter Cambria and Ragan with nobles. What strange mischance or unexpected hap hath thus deprived us of our father's presence? Can no man tell us what's become of him with whom we did converse not two days since? My lords, let everywhere light horse be sent and scour about through all our regiment. Dispatch a post immediately to Cornwall to see if any news be of him there. Myself will make a strict inquiry here, and all about our cities near at hand, till certain news of his abode is brought. All sorrow is but counterfeit to mine, whose lips are almost sealed up with grief. Mine is the substance, whilst they do but seem to weep the loss which tears cannot redeem. O oh, ne'er was heard so strange a misadventure, a thing so far beyond the reach of sense since no man's reason in the cause can enter. What hath removed my father thus from hence? Oh, I do fear some charm or invocation of wicked spirits or eternal fiends stirred by Cordella, moved this innovation, and brings my father timeless to his end. But might I know that the detested witch was certain cause of this uncertain ill, Myself to France would go in some disguise, and with these nails scratch out her hateful eyes. For since I am deprived of my father, I loathe my life and wish my death the rather. The heavens are just, and hate impiety, and will, no doubt, reveal such heinous crimes. Censor not any till you know the right. Let him be judge that bringeth truth to light. Oh, but my grief! Light to a swelling tide exceeds the bounds of calm and patience. Nor can I moderate my tongue so much to conceal them whom I hold in suspect. This matter shall be sifted. If it be she, a thousand Frances shall not harbour her. Enter the Gallian Ambassador. All happiness unto the Cambrian King. Welcome, my friend. From whence is thy ambassage? I came from Gallia unto Cornwall sent, with letters to your honourable father, whom there not finding, as I did expect, I was directed hither to repair. Frenchman, what is thy message to my father? My letters, madam, will import the same, which my commission is for to deliver. In his absence you may trust us with your letters. I must perform my charge in such a manner as I have strict commandment from the king. There is good packing twixt your king and you. You need not hither come to ask for him. You know where he is better than ourselves. Madam, I hope not far off. Hath the young murderess, your outrageous queen, no means to colour her detested deeds than finishing my guiltless father's days, because he gave her nothing for her dower, but by the colour of a feigned embassage to send him letters hither to our courts? Go carry them to them who sent them hither and bid them keep their scrolls unto themselves. They cannot blind us with such slight excuse to smother up so monstrous vile abuse. And were it not, it is against law of arms to offer violence to a messenger. We would inflict such torments unto thyself, as should enforce thee to reveal the truth. Madam, your threats no wit appall my mind. I know my conscience guiltless of this act, my king and queen, I dare be sworn, are free from any thought of such impiety. And therefore, madam, you have done them wrong, and ill-beseeming with a sister's love, who in mere duty tender him as much as ever you respected him for dower. The king your husband will not say as much. I will suspend my judgment for a time, till more appearance give us further light. Yet to be plain, your coming doth enforce a great suspicion to our doubtful mind 
and that you do resemble to be brief him that first robs and then cries stop the thief pray god some near you have not done the like hence saucy mate reply no more to us she strikes him for the law of arms shall not protect thy tongue <sighs> ne'er was i offered such discourtesy god and my king i trust ere it be long will find a mean to remedy this wrong exit ambassador how shall i live to suffer this disgrace at every base and vulgar peasant's hands it ill befitteth my imperial states to be thus used and no man take my part what should i do infringe the law of arms were to my everlasting obloquy but i will take revenge upon his master which sent him hither to delude us thus nay if you put up this be sure ere long now that my father thus is made away she'll come and claim the third part of your crown as due unto her inheritance but i will prove her title to be naught but shame and the reward of parricide and make her an example to the world for after ages to admire her penance this will i do as i am cambria's king or lose my life to prosecute revenge come first let's learn what news is of our father and then proceed as best occasion fits exeunt act five scene three a port on the coast of gallia enter lear perilous and two mariners in sea gowns and sea caps my honest friends we are ashamed to show the great extremity of our present state in that at this time we are brought so low that we want money for to pay our passage the truth is so we met with some good fellows a little before we came aboard your ship which stripped us quite of all the coin we had and left us not a penny in our purses yet wanting money we will use the mean to see you satisfied to the uttermost here's a good gown twould become a passing well looks on lear i should be fine in it here's a good cloak i marvel how i should look in it looks on perilous faith had we others to supply their room though ne'er so mean you willingly should have them do you hear sir you look like an honest man i'll not stand to do you a pleasure here's a good strong motley gabardine cost me fourteen good shillings at billingsgate give me a gown for it and your cap for mine and i'll forgive your passage with all my heart and twenty thanks lear and he change do you hear sir you shall have a better match than he because you are my friend here is a good sheep's russet sea gown will bide more stress i warrant you than two of his yet for you seem to be an honest gentleman i am content to change it for your cloak and ask you nothing for your passage more pulls off perilous's cloak my own i willingly would change with thee and think myself indebted to thy kindness but would my friend might keep his garment still my friend i'll give thee this new doublet if thou wilt restore his gown unto him back again nay if i do would i might never eat powdered beef and mustard more nor drink a can of good liquor whilst i live my friend you have a small reason to seek to hinder me of my bargain but the best is a bargain's a bargain to perilous kind friend it is much better as it is for by this means we may escape unknown till time and opportunity do fit hark hark they are laying their heads together they'll repent them of their bargain anon twere best for us to go while we are well god be with you sir for your passage back again i'll use you as unreasonable as another i know thou wilt but we hope to bring ready money with us when we come back again exeunt mariners whatever men in this extremity in a strange country and devoid of friends and not a penny for to help ourselves gain friend what thinkst thou will become of us be of good cheer my lord i have a doublet will yield us money enough to serve our turns until we come unto your daughter's court and then i hope we shall find friends enough ah oh, kind perilous that is it i fear and makes me faint for ever i come there can kindness spring out of ingratitude 
or love be reaped where hatred hath been sown can henbane join in league with mitradate or sugar grow in wormwood's bitter stalk it cannot be they are too opposite and so am i to any kindness here i have thrown wormwood on the sugared youth and like to henbane poisoned the fount whence flowed the mitradate of a child's good will i like an envious thorn have pricked the heart and turned sweet grapes to sour unrelished sloes the causeless ire of my respectless breast hath sowed the sweet milk of dame nature's paps my bitter words have galled her honey thoughts and weeds of rancour choked the flower of grace then what remainder is of any hope but all our fortunes will go quite a slope Fear not, my lord, the perfect good indeed can never be corrupted by the bad. A new fresh vessel still retains the taste of that which first is poured unto the same, and therefore, though you name yourself the thorn, the weed, the gall, the henbane, and the wormwood, yet she'll continue in her former state, the honey, milk, grape, sugar, mithridate. Thou pleasing auditor unto me in woe, cease to beguile me with thy hopeful speeches oh join with me and think of naught but crosses and then we'll one lament another's losses why say the worst the worst can be but death and death is better than for to despair than hazard death which may convert to life banish despair which brings a thousand deaths o come by thy strong arguments i yield to be directed by thee as thou wilt as thou yieldst comfort to my crazed thoughts would i yield the like unto thy body which is full weak i know and ill appeared for want of fresh meat and due sustenance alack my lord my heart doth bleed to think that you should be in such extremity come let us go and see what god will send when all means fail he is the surest friend exeunt act five scene four the open country near the coast of gallia enter the gallian king and queen and mumford with a basket disguised like country folk this tedious journey all on foot sweet love cannot be pleasing to your tender joints which ne'er were used to these toilsome walks i never in my life took more delight in any journey than i do in this it did me good when as we hap to light amongst the merry crew of country folk to see what industry and pains they took to win them commendations amongst their friends lord how they laboured to bestir themselves and in their quirks to go beyond the moon and so take on them with such antic fits that one would think they were beside their wits come away roger with your basket soft dame here comes a couple of old youths i must needs make myself fat with jesting at them enter lear and perilous very faintly nay prithee do not they do seem to be men much o'ercome with grief and misery let's stand aside and hearken what they say ah oh, my perilous now i see we both shall end our days in this unfruitful soil oh i do faint for want of sustenance and thou i know in little better case no gentle tree affords one taste of fruit to comfort us until we meet with men no lucky path conducts our luckless steps unto a place where any comfort dwells sweet rest betide unto our happy souls for here i see our bodies must have end ah oh, my dear lord how doth my heart lament to see you brought to this extremity oh if you love me as you do profess or ever thought well of me in my life he strips up his arm feed on this flesh whose veins are not so dry but there is virtue left to comfort you oh feed on this if this will do you good i'll smile for joy to see you suck my blood i am no cannibal that i should delight to slake my hungry jaws with human flesh i am no devil or ten times worse than so to suck the blood of such a peerless friend oh do not think that i respect my life so dearly 
as i do thy loyal love ah oh, britain i shall never see thee more that hast unkindly banished thy king and yet not thou dost make me do complain but they which were more near to me than thou what do i hear this lamentable voice methinks ere now i oftentimes have heard ah goneril was half my kingdom's gift the cause that thou didst seek to have my life ah cruel regan did i give thee all and all could not suffice without my blood ah poor cordella did i give thee naught nor never shall be able for to give oh let me warn all ages that ensueth how oh, they trust flattery and reject the truth well unkind girls i here forgive you both yet the just heavens will hardly do the like and only crave forgiveness at the end of good cordella and of thee my friend of god whose majesty i have offended by my transgression many thousand ways of her dear heart whom i for no occasion turned out of all through flatterer's persuasion of thee kind friend who but for me i know hadst never come unto this place of woe alack that ever i should live to see my noble father in this misery sweet love reveal not what thou art as yet until we know the ground of all this ill oh but some meat some meat do you not see how near they are to death for want of food lord which didst help thy servants at their need or now or never send us help with speed oh comfort comfort yonder is a banquet and men and women my lord be of good cheer for i see comfort coming very near oh my lord a banquet and men and women oh let kind pity mollify their hearts that they may help us in our great extremes god save you friends and if this blessed banquet affordeth any food or sustenance even for his sake that saveth us all from death vouchsafe to save us from the gripe of famine she bringeth him to the table here father sit and eat here sit and drink and would it were far better for your sakes perilous takes lear by the hand to the table i'll give you thanks anon my friend doth faint and needeth present comfort lear drinks i warrant he ne'er stays to say a grace oh there's no sauce to a good stomach the blessed god of heaven hath thought upon us the thanks be his and these kind courteous folk by whose humanity we are preserved they eat hungrily lear drinks and may that draught be unto him as was that which old aeson drank which did renew his withered age and make him young again and may that meat be unto him as was that which elias ate in strength whereof he walked forty days and never fainted shall i conceal me longer from my father or shall i manifest myself to him forbear a while until his strength return lest being overjoyed with seeing thee his poor weak senses should forsake their office and so our cause of joy be turned to sorrow what cheer my lord how do you feel yourself methinks i never ate such savoury meat it is as pleasant as a blessed manna that reigned from heaven amongst the israelites it hath recalled my spirits home again and made me fresh as erst i was before but how shall we congratulate their kindness in faith i know not how sufficiently but the best mean that i can think on is this i'll offer them my doublet in requital for we have nothing else to spare nay stay perilous for they shall have mine pardon my lord i swear they shall have mine perilous proffers his doublet they will not take it ah who would think such kindness should remain among such strange and unacquainted men and that such hate should harbour in the breast of those which have occasion to be best ah good old father to tell me thy grief i'll sorrow with thee if not add relief ah good young daughter i may call thee so for thou art like a daughter i did owe do you not owe her still what is she dead no god forbid but all my interests gone by showing myself too much unnatural 
so have i lost the title of a father and may be called a stranger to her rather your title's still good for tis always known a man may do as him list with his own but have you but one daughter then in all yes i have more by two than would i had oh say not so but rather see the end they that are bad may have the grace to mend but how have they offended you so much if from the first i should relate the cause twould make a heart of adamant to weep and thou poor soul kind-hearted as thou art dost weep already ere i do begin for god's love tell it and when you have done i'll tell the reason why i weep so soon then know this first i am britain born and had three daughters by one loving wife and though i see it of beauty they were sped especially the youngest of the three for her perfections hardly matched could be on these i doted with a jealous love and thought to try which of them loved me best by asking them which would do most for me the first and second flattered me with words and vowed they loved me better than their lives the youngest said she loved me as a child might do her answer i esteemed most vile and presently in an outrageous mood i turned her from me to go sink or swim and all i had even to the very clothes i gave in dowry with the other two and she that best deserved the greatest share i gave her nothing but disgrace and care now mark the sequel when i had done thus i sojourned in my oldest daughter's house where for a time i was entreated well and lived in state sufficing my content but every day her kindness did grow cold which i with patience put up well enough and seemed not to see the things i saw but at the last she grew so far incensed with moody fury and with causeless hate that in the most vile and contumelious terms she bade me pack and harbour somewhere else then was i fain for refuge to repair unto my other daughter for relief who gave me pleasing and most courteous words but in her actions showed herself so sore as never any daughter did before she prayed me in a morning out by time to go to a thicket two miles from the court pointing that there she would come talk with me there she had set the shag-haired murdering wretch to massacre my honest friend and me then judge yourself though my tale be brief if ever man had greater cause of grief nor never like impiety was done since the creation of the world began and now i am constrained to seek relief of her to whom i have been so unkind who censure if it do award me death so i must confess she pays me but my due but if she show a loving daughter's part it comes of god and her not my desert no doubt she will i dare be sworn she will how know you that not knowing what she is myself a father have a great way hence used me as ill as ever you did her yet that his reverend age i once might see i'd creep along to meet him on my knee oh no men's children are unkind but mine condemn not all because of others crime but look dear father look behold and see thy loving daughter speaketh unto thee she kneels oh stand thou up it is my part to kneel and ask forgiveness for my former faults he kneels oh if you wish i shall enjoy my breath dear father rise or i receive my death he riseth then i will rise to satisfy your mind but kneel again till pardon be resigned he kneels i pardon you the word beseems not me but i do say so for to ease your knee you gave me life you were the cause that i am what i am who else had never been but you gave life to me and to my friend whose days at else had an untimely end you brought me up when as i was but young and far unable to help myself 
I cast thee forth when as thou wast but young, and far unable for to help thyself. God, world, and nature, say I do you wrong that can endure to see you kneel so long. Let me break off this loving controversy which doth rejoice my very soul to see. Good father, rise, she is your loving daughter, and honours you with as respective duty as if you were the monarch of the world. He riseth. But I will never rise from off my knee. She kneels. Until I have your blessing and your pardon of all my faults committed any way, from my first birth unto this present day. The blessing which the God of Abraham gave unto the tribe of Judah light on thee, and multiply thy days, that thou mayst see thy children's children prosper after thee. Thy faults, which are just none that I do know, God pardon on high, and I forgive below. She riseth. Now is my heart at quiet, and doth leap within my breast for joy of this good hap. And now, dear father, welcome to our court, and welcome, kind perilous, unto me, mirror of virtue and true honesty. Oh, he hath been the kindest friend to me that ever man had in adversity. My tongue doth fail to say what heart doth think, I am so ravished with exceeding joy. All you have spoke, now let me speak my mind, and in few words much matter here conclude. He nails. If e'er my heart do harbour any joy, or true content repose within my breast, till I have rooted out this viperous sect, and repossessed my father of his crown, let me be counted for the perjured man that ever spake word since the world began. Rises. Let me pray, too, that never prayed before. Mumford nails. If e'er I re-salute the British earth, as e'er it be long, I do presume I shall, and do return from thence without my wench, let me be gilded for my recompense. Rises. Come, let's to arms, for to redress this wrong. Till I am there, methinks the time seems long. Exeunt. Act five, scene five. A room in the royal palace of Cambria. Enter Regan Sola. I feel a hell of conscience in my breast, tormenting me with horror for my fact, and makes me in an agony of doubt, for fear the world should find my dealing out. The slave whom I appointed for the act I ne'er set eyes upon the peasant since. Oh, could I get him for to make him sure, my doubts would cease and I should rest secure. But if the old man, with persuasive words, hath saved their lives and made him so relent, then are they fled unto the court of France and like a trumpet manifest my shame. A shame on these white-lithered slaves, I say, that with fair words so soon are overcome. O oh God, that I had been but made a man, or that my strength were equal to my will! These foolish men are nothing but mere pity, and melt as butter doth against the sun. Why should they have pre-eminence over us, since we are creatures of more brave resolve? I swear I am quite out of charity with all the heartless men in Christendom. A pox upon them, when they are afraid to give a stab or slit a paltry windpipe which are so easy matters to be done. Well, had I thought the slave would serve me so, myself would have been executioner. <sighs> Tis now undone, and if that it be known, I'll make a good shift as I can for one. He that repines at me, howe'er it stands, twere best for him to keep him from my hands. Exit. Act five, scene six, a port of Gallia. Sounds, drums, and trumpets. Enter the Gallian king, Lear, Mumford, and the army. Thus have we brought our army to the sea, whereas our ships are ready to receive us. The wind stands fair, and we in four hours sail may easily arrive on British shore, where unexpected we may them surprise, and gain a glorious victory with ease. Wherefore, my loving countrymen, resolve, since truth and justice fighteth on our sides, that we shall march with conquest where we go. Myself will be as forward as the first, and step by step march with the hardiest white, and not the meanest soldier in our camp shall be in danger, but I'll second him. To you, my lord, we give the whole command of all the army next unto ourself. 
not doubting of you but you will extend your wonted valour in this needful case encouraging the rest to do the like by your approved magnanimity my liege tis needless to spur a willing horse that's active enough to run himself to death for here i swear by that sweet saint's bright eyes which are the stars which guide me to a good hap either to see my old lord crowned anew or in his cause to bid the world adieu thanks good lord mumford tis more of your good will than any merit or desert in me and now to you my worthy countrymen ye valiant race of genovest and gulls surnamed redshanks for your chivalry because you fight up to the shanks in blood show yourself now to be the right gauls indeed and be so bitter on your enemies that they may say you are as bitter as gaul gaul them brave shot with your artillery gaul them brave halberts with your sharp point bills each in their pointed place not one but all fight for the credit of yourself and gaul then what should more persuasion need to those that rather wish to deal than hear of blows let's to our ships and if that god permit in four hours sail i hope we shall be there and in five hours more i make no doubt but we shall bring our wished desires about exeunt act five scene seven the ramparts of a town in britain dover enter a captain of the watch and two watchmen my honest friends it is your turn to-night to watch in this place near about the beacon and vigilantly have regard if any fleet of ships pass hitherward which if you do your office is to fire the beacon presently and raise the town exit ay 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 fear nothing we know our charge i warrant i have been a watchman about this beacon this thirty year and yet i ne'er see it stir but stood as quietly as might be faith neighbour and you follow my advice instead of watching the beacon we'll go to goodman jennings and wash a pot of ale and a rasher of bacon and if we do not drink ourselves drunk then so i warrant the beacon will see us when we come out again ay but how if somebody excuse us to the captain tis no matter i'll prove by good reason that we watch the beacon s for example i hope you do not call me ass by craft neighbour no no but for example so here stands the pot of ale that's the beacon ay ay it is a very good beacon well say so here stands your nose that's the fire indeed i must confess tis somewhat red i see come march in a dish half a score pieces of salt bacon i understand your meaning that's as much as to say half a score ships true you consta right presently like a faithful watchman i fire the beacon and call up the town ay that's as much as to say you set your nose to the pot and drink up the drink you are in the right come let's go fire the beacon exeunt act five scene eight before the walls of a town in britain dover enter the king of gallia with a still march mumford and soldiers now march our ensigns on the british earth and we are near approaching to the town then look about you valiant countrymen and we shall finish this exploit with ease the inhabitants of this mistrustful place are dead asleep as men that are secure here shall we skirmish but with naked men devoid of sense new waked from a dream that know not what our coming may pretend till they do feel our meaning on their skins therefore assail god and our right for us Exeunt. Act five, scene nine. An open place in a town of Britain. Alarm, with men and women half naked. Enter two captains without doublets, with swords. Where well, are these villains that were set to watch, and fire the beacon if occasion served, that thus have suffered us to be surprised, never given notice to the town? We are betrayed and quite devoid of hope, by any means to fortify ourselves. "'Tis ten to one the peasants are all come with drink and sleep, and so neglect their charge.' "'A whirlwind carry them quick to a whirlpool, 
that there the slaves may drink their bellies full. This tis to have the beacon so near the alehouse. Enter the watchman, drunk, with each a pot. Out on you, villains, whither you run now. To fire the town and call up the beacon. <clears throat> no, no, sir, to fire the beacon. He drinks. What, with a pot of ale, you drunken rogues? You'll fire the beacon when the town is lost. I'll teach you how to tend your office better. Draws to stab them. Enter Mumford. Captains run away. Yield, yield, yield. He kicks down their pots. Reel? No, we do not reel. You may lack a pot of ale ere you die. But in mean space, I answer, you want none. Well, there's no dealing with you. You are tall men, and well weaponed. I would there were no worse than you in the town. Exit. Ah, uh, speaks like an honest man. My call is past already. Come, neighbour, let's go. Nay, let's first see if we can stand. Exeunt. Alarum. Excursions. Mumford after them, and some half naked. Act five, scene ten. An open place in a town of Britain. Enter the Gallian King, Lear, Mumford, Cordella, Perilous, and soldiers, with the chief of the town bound. Fear not, my friends, you shall receive no hurt if you'll subscribe unto your lawful king and quite revoke your fealty from Cambria, and from aspiring Cornwall too, whose wives have practised treason against their father's life. We come in justice of your wronged king, and do intend no harm at all to you, so you submit unto your lawful king. Kind countrymen, it grieves me that perforce I am constrained to use extremities. Long have you been looked for, good my lord, and wished for by a general consent, and had we known your highness had arrived, we had not made resistance to your grace. And now, my gracious lord, you need not doubt, but all the country will yield presently, which, since your absence, have been greatly taxed for to maintain their overswelling pride. We'll presently send word to all our friends. When they have notice, they will come apace. Thanks, loving subjects, and thanks, worthy son, thanks, my kind daughter, thanks to you, my lord, who willingly adventured have your blood, without desert, to do me so much good. Oh, say not so. I have been much beholding to your grace. I must confess I have been in some skirmishes, but I was never in the likes to this, for where I was wont to meet with armed men, I was now encountered with naked women. We that are feeble and want use of arms will pray to God to shield you from all harms. The while your hands do manage ceaseless toil, our hearts shall pray, the foes may have the foil. We'll fast and pray, whilst you for us do fight, that victory may prosecute the right. Methinks your words do amplify, my friends, and add fresh vigour to my willing limbs. Drum. But hark, I hear the adverse drum approach. God and our right, St. Dennis and St. George. Enter Cornwall, Cambria, Goneril, Regan, and the army. Presumptuous king of Gauls, how darest thou presume to enter on our British shore? And more than that, to take our towns perforce, and draw our subjects' hearts from their true king? Be sure to buy it at as dear a price, as e'er you bought presumption in your lives. Poor daring Cornwall, know we came in right and just revengement of the wronged king, whose daughters there, fell vipers as they are, have sought to murder and deprive of life. But God protected him from all their spite, and we are come in justice of his right. Nor he nor thou have any interest here, but what you win and purchase with the sword. Thy slanders to our noble virtuous queens will in the battle thrust them down thy throat. Except for fear of our revenging hands, thou fly to sea, as not secure on lands. Welshman, I'll so ferret you ere night for that word, that you shall have no mind to crack so well this twelvemonth. They lie that say we sought our father's death. Tis merely forged for our colour's sake to set a gloss on your invasion. Methinks an old man ready for to die. 
should be ashamed to broach so foul a lie fie shameless sister so devoid of grace to call our father a liar to his face peace puritan dissembling hypocrite which art so good that thou wilt prove stark not anon when as i have you in my fingers i'll make you wish yourself in purgatory nay peace thou monster shame unto thy sex thou fiend in likeness of a human creature i never heard a fouler spoken man out on thee viper scum filthy parricide more odious to my sight than is a toad knowest thou these letters she snatches them and tears them thinks you to outface me with your paltry scrolls you come to drive my husband from his rights unto the colour of a forged letter who ever heard the like impiety you are our debtor of more patience we were more patient when we stayed for you within the thicket two long hours and more what hours what thickets there where you sent your servant with your letters sealed with your hand to send us both to heaven where as i think you never mean to come alas you are grown a child again with age or else your senses dote for want of sleep indeed you made us rise with times you know yet had a care we should sleep where you bade us stay but never wake more till the latter day peace peace old fellow thou art sleepy still faith and if you reason till to-morrow you get no other answer at their hands tis pity two such good faces should have so little grace between them well let us see if their husbands with their hands can do as much as they do with their tongues ay with their swords they'll make your tongues unsay what they have said or else they'll cut them out to it gallants to it let's not stand brawling thus exeunt both armies act five scene eleven a battlefield outside the walls of a town of britain sound alarum excursions mumford must chase cambria away then cease enter cornwall the day is lost our friends do all revolt and join against us with the adverse pot there is no means of safety but by flight and therefore all to cornwall with my queen exit enter cambria i think there is a devil in the camp hath haunted me to-day he hath so tired me that in a manner i can fight no more enter mumford zounds here he comes i'll take me to my horse exit mumford follows him to the door and returns farewell welshman give thee but thy due thou hast a light and nimble pair of legs thou art more in debt to them than to thy hands but if i meet thee once again to-day i'll cut them off and set them to a better heart exit act five scene twelve the same alarums and excursions then sound victory enter lear perilous king cordella and mumford thanks be to god your foes are overcome and you again possess it of your right first to the heavens next thanks to you my son by whose good means i repossess the same which if it please you to accept yourself with all my heart i will resign to you for it is yours by right and none of mine first have you raised at your own charge a power of valiant soldiers this comes all from you next have you ventured your own person scathe and lastly worthy gallia never stained my kingly title i by thee have gained thank heavens not me my zeal to you is such command my utmost i will never grudge he that with all kind love entreats his queen will not be to her father unkind seen ah my cordella now i call to mind the modest answer which i took unkind but now i see i am no whit beguiled thou lovedst me dearly and as art a child and thou perilous partner once in woe thee to requite the best i can i'll do yet all i can i were it ne'er so much were not sufficient thy true love is such thanks worthy mumford to thee last of all 
not greeted last cause thy desert was small no thou hast lion like laid on to-day chasing the cornwall king and cambria who oh, with my daughters daughters did i say to save their lives the fugitives did play come son and daughter who did me advance repose with me a while and then for france sound of drums and trumpets exeunt end of act five end of king lear and his three daughters by anonymous